bring some of that landscaping back uh, to the project and 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 just soften the views uh, in uh, from from across the alley. Okay, and then we're back here to uh, really the the sort of centerpiece of the commercial experience here is that Paseo um, and Allison described. There's a mix mix of uh, retail opportunities here. Yes, it would be great to have a dry cleaner, to have a UPS store. There's an opportunity for all these things. We have the people who are living here uh, want those sort of services as much as the community around. Um, and they do want to have a good grocery store that they can just walk down to and not have to drive a car. So um, I know we have a lot of people tonight, so I'm just going to uh, leave it at that. Um, and this is the website for information about the project. Um, and we will be posting, I believe, Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're going to be posting uh, this presentation and also the comments that are received. Is that correct? That's, yep. That's uh, beautiful. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to leave it at that because I know we have a lot of folks, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions. And before we dive into questions and take your comments, uh, I do want to say just a couple of words at the outset about our process and our application and requests. Uh, the, the project will be reviewed by the city uh, through what's called an administrative approval process. The reason for that is the applicant filed what's called a preliminary application back in January. And what that does under state law for a housing, predominantly housing project like this, is it locks in the rules, ordinances, policies that were in place at the time that preliminary application was filed. Those rules allow uh, this project to proceed with an administrative approval. And we are also seeking density bonus uh, benefits allowed under a state law called the State Density Bonus Law that allows applicants to uh, achieve certain benefits um, and, and features of a project by virtue of providing very low income affordable housing units. So through that process, uh, we are seeking uh, additional height to accommodate the density, the square footage that the project is proposing. And that is consistent with a, a policy and program the city has adopted to institute that state density bonus law locally. The administrative approval process with our density bonus requests is, is not a, a short process. It's a long exacting review by the city. It will be reviewed uh, in detail by a myriad of departments for all the various things that we're seeing popping up in the chat for issues related to circulation, safety, infrastructure, sustainability, and the like. Um, there will be a public hearing associated with the design of the project before the city's architectural review board, but that is towards the end of the process, uh, much farther down the line. So we are literally at the early, early outset of this effort. We have not even filed the main application yet, because again, the city requires that this community meeting be held to do that. So wanted to just uh, disclose that. I'm sure there may be further questions, but I uh, wanted to be clear about the process that will transpire from here after this community meeting uh, is finished. So with that, uh, Melissa, if you could uh, start um, unmuting folks, taking raised hands so we can hear uh, everyone's comments and questions. Great. What we're going to do, I'm going to call out three names and um, and and then uh, sequentially unmute speakers. And um, we, we've got a lot of people here tonight. Uh, 504 people are attending. We have a lot of speakers. So we're going to ask you to limit your um, comments to two minutes. And as you see in the chat, um, we're going to give everyone one pass at a comment because there's so many people we uh have limited time so uh appreciate it um our first person is i'll, I'll say the first three william waddell sherry silverton and chris mack i'm going to unmute uh, uh william he's still on mute yeah i'm hitting the uh ask to unmute. <laughs> there it is. Yes, hi. No, I was only uh, commenting that early on you were wondering if you could show all the participants. And I was just mentioning that you can have multiple screens. 
if you want to have a participant view. Thank you. Uh, I'm not uh, sure if we're able to do this. This is being done with uh, with um, panelists and attendees. I'm not um, sure that that can be done, but appreciate the um, input. Thanks, William. You're welcome. Uh, the next person is uh, Sherry Silverton. I'm unmuting you. Thank you. And you'll be followed by Chris Mack and Todd Erlinson. My question is about water. I'm told as the city stands, we have a big water shortage. You've got a huge amount of units going in. How are you going to add water to the city's water supply? So I'll, I'll answer that question. The city of Santa Monica actually has a very unique um, and, and, and forward thinking ordinance called the Water Neutrality Ordinance. And it actually requires that new projects achieve a, a net neutral uh, water demand. And to the extent there's additional water required by a new development, offsets are required um, as the obligation of, of that of that new project in order to achieve that that water neutrality. So, you know, one of the things that happens when a project like this is proposed is all the infrastructure issue issues are fully vetted by the city. So we can't get a building permit unless it's demonstrated that there's adequate sewer capacity, adequate water supply, all those things. But in addition to that, Santa Monica goes well beyond most municipalities and requires this water offset program. So through that, uh, we're confident that the water supply will, will be met and that offsets will be provided um, to achieve water savings elsewhere um, in, the, in light of the net increase of the new development. What do you mean by offsets? Exactly what are you gonna do? So there's fees that have to be paid, substantial fees that go towards um, water savings programs, um, promoting water conservation, um, and other aspects in order to achieve water savings elsewhere off-site uh, in the city. Are our bills going to go up? Um, I, I, when you say offsets and you're saying there are fees, we, the yeah, so I mean, our bills are going to go up. That's I don't see how else they can do it. Now, uh, by offsets, it's it's the project promoting water conservation and savings off the property site. So it's not it's not something that's gonna raise your water bills, certainly not this project. Um, it's designed to promote conservation throughout the city to ensure that this project, additional water supply is offset, it's reduced through that program. Melissa, do you wanna promote the next? Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not sure that, you know, if this is, if we're doing this right to be candid in terms of, um, are we promoting people to panelists or, do, how is no, that? I, I'm, I, we're in attendees mode, and I'm just asking them to unmute, just like a regular Zoom. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you very much, Sherry. Um, the next person uh, I'm calling on is Chris Mack, followed by Todd Erlinson and John Given. Uh, Chris, I just ask you to unmute. There you go. Good evening. Uh, Chris McLeod, the Pico Neighborhood Association Chair. Um, I'm curious, is, is this a scam project? Is this just a scoping meeting? Because uh, there's no way you can get water in Santa Monica for a project this size. You'll never get a connection. So uh, it, this is just one of the things that says it's a scam. And then you've got Hank Coning, which is number two. You know, this is not looking good. So are you going to dump this project in the future to the largest bidder and something else is going to go there not what you're talking about tonight because i think we answered that question when she, in response to sherry you know, the project could not get a building permit it could not get built unless adequate water supply is demonstrated so uh we fully expect that to be the case and to the extent for some very unexpected reason that wouldn't be the case the project couldn't get built. So the city has extensive processes in place to ensure that those, those infrastructure is adequate to serve you know, all new development, this one included. So you're saying you have a permit? 
no, we do not have a permit. Um, as I said, we are at the very beginning of the process. We have an extended uh, effort to go through with the city uh, where they verify all number of different things, infrastructure included, and only at the end of that process is a permit issued. And we are a long way from that. So we do not have a permit. All right. So unless you guys uh, strike a, a water well, you guys aren't going very far. Thanks very much. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next is uh, Todd Erlinson, followed by John Given and uh, Michael Kahn. Let's see, Todd, I'm sorry. There he is. Melissa, can you hear me? Yes. Great. I just wanted to say um, I'm a local resident. In, uh, in the neighborhood, Ocean Park. I've uh, been here for 25 years. I'm also an architect and I have a business on Lincoln Boulevard about three or four blocks away from this project. Um, you know, I've been on Lincoln for 25 years and we've been hearing about this project but really have not seen much happen on the entire stretch of Lincoln um, in that time. And I've been also been hearing about this project on this property and I think it's about time that some of these projects happen and that we kind of, we kind of see uh, Lincoln grow and change and, and become uh, more of an artery and, and uh, a part of the city. So um, I appreciate, I personally appreciate the thoughtfulness of the design by, Hon by Koning Eisenberg. And um, I also appreciate this process because I know the project will grow and develop and will respond to these comments. I think the, the city and and the architect and the developer are listening and that uh, they'll do their best to, um, to, to mediate or, or kind of adjust the project if necessary or if possible to, uh, to the comments that we're making tonight. So, so that's all I have to say. Thank you, Todd. Uh, appreciate it. Um, I'm moving down the list here. Uh, John Given, uh, followed by Michael Kahn, and Peter Altshuler, uh, I'll unmute you, uh, John. John, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm John Given. I'm a 40 year resident of Ocean Park and I'm in favor of the proposed project Lincoln Center. This is from where I begin. Our housing markets and housing affordability are crushed by inadequate supply. Urban housing development density is a superior solution to auto-centric sprawl. Progressive Santa Monica is a community that seeks to be a part of the solution. We have been doing this and the city keeps improving. This is how. Target housing development in locations which do not displace existing housing. We have the land area and aging auto-centric and underutilized strip commercial properties. This is exactly the circumstance of the proposed Lincoln Center. The project has been described in flyers um, in alarmist terms because it has 10 buildings. This is just bizarre since the design uses multiple buildings to break down massing to an urban scale overlooking pedestrian oriented commercial plazas instead of a large and of a much larger, more uh, cost efficient block, multiple buildings are planned to bring light air and see through sight lines into the property and greater habitability of the individual units. The pattern of development is not inconsistent with apartment blocks throughout my neighborhood in Santa Monica. The affordable housing included in the proposal is 100% financed by the developer. My estimate is this is probably a $25 million hit to the project. Would I like to see more affordable housing? Yes, but the city doesn't have the funds. Perhaps the project, as the pro property is developed and occupied, there will be opportunity to increase affordability with acquisition funds or housing assistance vouchers. But you can't get there if the project doesn't move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, John. Um, as I move down the list, uh, Michael Kahn, followed by Peter Alshuler, uh, followed by Mitch Greenhill. Thank you very much for having me, Michael Kahn. 
Um, I've, I've, almost 10 years or more than 10 years ago, I was at the Albertson as it was then, and we were cleaning up the parking lot and the bushes and everything. It was part of the Beautify Lincoln um, thing that it was called Stinking Lincoln um, back then. And that project um, back then, we were already kind of fighting with this beast, which is Lincoln Boulevard. And it is a beast, not because it's called a boulevard, but it's a beast because there are so many cars on it. And it's so, so much of a destination of cars. Um, and, and you see all the, the car lots and the car repair places and all of that. That's not a community. That's not a place where people want to be. And that's not a place we want to defend or maintain or, or, or consider a community asset. It's a, it's a con community liability. And I'm grateful for this project that takes away this liability and that ugliness that pervades there. Um, I don't understand why some people in the community think that parking lot is something that needs to be preserved. I've never seen them cleaning up the bushes there. I just fear that they think out of a not in my neighborhood and we are a little beach community town attitude. I'm sorry for that attitude because it's really an attitude that is um, comes together with this whole car mentality that has um, d delivered us a climate emergency for which um, we have to thank them, I think, or maybe not thank them. Um, anyhow, thank you for go going ahead for, 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 for presenting this and thank you for improving Stinking Lincoln. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is, uh, I'm trying to find Mitch, Mitch Greenhill, followed by Peter Spellman and Arlene. I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name. Um, Peter? I've been here as long as some of those earlier speakers. In fact, I've been here for 42 years. And I've seen Santa Monica be transformed from its quaint resort community into what is essentially Manhattan by the sea. The state has attempted to increase the affordability of a city that is ranked amongst the most expensive in Southern California. But this project doesn't do that. It has cited State Senate Bill 330 in claiming a density bonus, but the project does not meet the minimum requirements for such an increase in the number of units. It does not provide the required number of low-income residences and does not adhere to existing or proposed changes in multi-use boulevard low zoning, which limits heights to 47 feet. How did your company calculate its qualification for a density bonus and greater height? Thank you, Peter, for your comment or question. Peter, we will absolutely answer that, um, but it, well, let's take a few more questions and I'll answer in batches, but we will. Um, our next uh, speaker is Mitch Greenhill. Mitch. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I've been a resident of Ocean Park since 1976. My question Originally, it was going to be, have you done a traffic study? But I guess in the presentation, I found out that you haven't, which I find a bit shocking. Um, and I, I think the traffic is a big issue here. I feel that pro the project is way too big. 520 units in, a, in Ocean Park is just, uh, that's probably as many units as between my place and, uh, and uh, the site, which is, you know, eight blocks or something. But, you know, I can actually see some, uh, the, the presentation was kind of interesting. I could imagine that project being very appropriate uh, on the site of the Blue, Blue Bus uh, Maintenance Yard, which is, you know, two blocks away from the metro station. That's where you should put 500 units, where people can walk to the metro station. You should not put 500 units at the corner of Lincoln Boulevard and Ocean Park Boulevard. It's just way out of scale. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Um, our next question is uh, 
from Peter Spellman, and then it'll be followed by Arlene and Jeremy. So I'm gonna unmute uh, you, Mr. Spellman. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm a 44 year resident of Ocean Park. Uh, the problem I'm having with this meeting is I don't feel like it's a meeting. A meeting implies two people or two sides communicating with each other and exchanging ideas. What I'm seeing is this is an announcement about your project. Your project is already set in stone. So I think the only, as several of you have said already, the only reason we're talking is because having a quote community meeting unquote is mandated by the administrative code that you have to follow. You don't really care about what we say. We're just venting. We just live here. We're the people who are gonna be stuck with this monstrosity, all the traffic. You haven't even studied it. The water, you haven't even really looked at that. None of this stuff, the out of, hugely out of scale. Interestingly, all the pictures of the project, none of them were pictures with the neighborhood included. None of them, not one. Isn't that interesting? Because if you did that, you'd see how out of scale it is. So what I really want to know is really, do you give a shit about anything that we say? You're going to do your project, make as much money as you can out of it, stick as many units in there as possible. And what I would say to the 500 people listening is if you really care about our neighborhoods, you're going to put political pressure, you're going to put legal pressure and economic pressure on the developer and the architect. And that's the only way that a change is gonna happen. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Okay, let's stop and go through those questions. First, Mr. Altshore. So uh, to clarify, I did not cite SB 330 uh, for the density bonus. That is the state law that allows us to file a preliminary application and essentially vest under the rules in place at that time, allowing us to proceed with an administrative approval. The density bonus, the additional FAR and the height that you referenced is achieved through the provisions of the state density bonus law, which governs every municipality in the city, including Santa Monica. How we have calculated the density bonus request is essentially the tier one baseline standards, which the city requires as the base for a density bonus, allow an FAR of one and a half times the, the size of the lot. Um, and by virtue of providing 15% very low income units, um, that's one of the deepest affordability levels that exists uh, when it comes to restricted affordable units, the project's entitled to a 50% FAR increase, achieving a FAR of 2.25 to one, that's 2.25 si the size of the lot. So that's the square footage. Um, and the height is uh, achievable by seeking what's called the density bonus waiver of development standard. And what the state law says is, once that density bonus is applied in Santa Monica, meaning the extra square footage, if there's a development standard in the code that precludes the ability to achieve that square footage, then the standard can be waived. And we are seeking to increase the height to five stories in order to accommodate the square footage awarded through the density bonus. Um, and again, that is a function of the project providing 53 very low income units in order to do that. This is not the first project that has uh, proposed these sorts of requests in Santa Monica. The city approved a density bonus project on a commercial boulevard with the exact same zoning as this property. And that project was awarded the exact same FAR increase uh, that 50% FAR increase that I mentioned for providing the same percentage of affordable units. So there is precedent for this request and how those um, additional square footages were calculated. With respect to Mr. Greenhill's comments about traffic, appreciate, uh, of course, those concerns. They are critical concerns, not only for the community, but for the applicant. To the extent this project gets the circulation wrong, then we have a huge problem in that no one will want to live here, which is obviously not what this effort is about. So it is critical for all parties involved, us included, to make sure that the circulation gets done right. And as a result, we've hired a traffic engineer who will be looking at 
you know, those circulation issues to make sure that this project is accommodated in a way that creates the least amount of you know, negative conditions on the surrounding roadways as possible. And I will tell you the city and the mobility division at the city has a, a, an extremely uh, comprehensive review of those issues to ensure safety, adequate circulation within the vicinity of the site. And I, I respectfully would disagree with your, your uh, proposition that these units have no place on a commercial boulevard such as the corner of, of Lincoln and Ocean Park. Here we have an outdated commercial building and a surface parking lot. And this is city of Santa Monica has been allocated 9,000 units to build by the state of California over the course of the next eight years. So it's not a matter of housing not getting built. Housing has to get built to meet state demands, to address the housing crisis. So the question is, where do you put those units? You know, do you put them in the R1 neighborhoods? densify single family stable neighborhoods? Do you put them in R2, R3 neighborhoods where you would displace existing tenants, many of them rent control tenants? Or do you put them on surface parking lots on the commercial boulevards proximate to transit and make it bike friendly and pedestrian friendly, which is our objective here. So we do believe this is an appropriate place for density, especially in light of the city's housing obligations and the need for housing in, in our region and also in the city. Uh, and uh, the project, in our estimation, has been designed to break up massing, to be porous, to be inviting, and to not be a monolithic, you know, single structure that looks superimposing from the from the streetscape, but rather looks inviting and welcoming as a place you both want to go, shop, and live. Lastly, um, Mr. Spielman's questions. We do give a damn. Um, we, we are interested in community feedback. We got some feedback at the last meeting that was instructive and that is actionable, frankly, and helpful. Um, and so, yes, this is a required meeting. That is absolutely the case. But um, the applicant team is taking notes. We are listening to your comments, suggestions. Um, yes, this is a, a team that is proposing to build a project. Um, and we have certain objectives with respect to density and commercial square footage and uses and the like. Um, but we are absolutely interested in the feedback received at this meeting. And as I would, I don't speak for the city, of course, but I would suggest the city is as well. And that's why they are uh, uh, requiring a report of this meeting and why we will be submitting uh, all of your comments to the city as part of our application process. So with that, Melissa, why don't we go to the next three callers? Okay, doke. Um, Arlene, followed by Jeremy, followed by Elizabeth Rooks. I'm going to uh, unmute you, Arlene. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I uh, would like to just thank the two gentlemen by the name of Peter for their comments. We need people that are that kind of serious thinkers. Uh, my family has been in Sunset Park since the 60s. Uh, you used to be able to walk around here and feel safe and comfortable. Uh, the kind of density you're talking about, it makes it, we can't even use Lincoln Boulevard as it is. You have to time it. Otherwise, you, you're unable to, to, to use Lincoln Boulevard. The kind of density you're talking about is gonna make it useless, absolutely useless to drive down Lincoln Boulevard. And until you address the water, we have, we, the, we're, we're wasting our time here. I don't want to see your designs. You address the problems, make sense out of them. And, and just because the state's crazy, we don't all have to get crazy. There's no reason for us to be increasing all the density in just this small town of Santa Monica. It's illogical. It makes absolutely no sense. And we need more common sense and the people that are here paying the taxes need to have their needs addressed not just future and additional people that you are just compounding the problems and making the density impossible we can barely function right now you had plenty of people with your traffic study on uh, ocean park boulevard we attended those meetings. My husband's a retired civil engineer. We told him about the insanity. I am lucky if I see one or two bicycles ride down the bicycle lane 
on Ocean Park. And that was years ago. And that was supposed to create all this wonderful transportation for bicyclists. Well, all it did was increase the, the traffic on Ocean Park Boulevard because we lost a lane in each direction. So I'm not impressed with your traffic studies. I'm not impressed with all your Conver your talk here, you can you can jar and change those studies to make it look like whatever you want it to look like. And I'm just really not impressed at all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now go on to um, Jeremy, let me unmute you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to use the whole two minutes and not yell at you guys, okay? Um, uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I live in the neighborhood. I'm a huge fan of the project uh, by sole virtue of the fact that we need 20 of them. Uh, we don't, we you know, we need, we need 15, 20 more of these things um, to, to make a dent into the housing crisis. I actually have a real question. Uh, Dave, you mentioned the uh, state density bonus law. Did, did you guys maximize the 50% density bonus? You're not leaving a unit on the table here? Yes, uh, it, the way Santa Monica does it, which is somewhat unique, uh, because um, many cities in their commercial districts r regulate development by density, which is yeah, traditional yeah. density, which is, uh, right. Jeremy, it's the number of units per the size of the lot. Yeah, um, yeah. Santa Monica doesn't do that in the commercial districts. They regulate it's by FAR, building, right? uh, exactly, by building yeah. envelope, height to height and FAR primarily. So the density bonus, which is the maximum 50% uh, permitted under the state law for providing the maximum 15% of the base density, the pre-density bonus um, right. project is very low income. That that yields the FAR here in this case of 2.25, which is being proposed. Okay, when you when you submitted your your baseline project, you like inflated it as much as humanly possible to maximize the number of the the square footage that you're allowed. I don't know what you mean by our baseline project and maximize that. We are seeking the 50% density yeah, slash FDR right. increased yeah yeah, yeah yeah cool i just want to make sure that you guys aren't leaving it you know because a lot of projects especially with all of the uh, uh sort of antagonist relationship with communities end up not utilizing the full density bonus and i just want to make sure that you guys are so that's awesome um totally appreciate it and uh you guys are almost done stay the course uh and uh look forward to seeing the project uh, being built thank you jeremy um there was Elizabeth Brooks in the queue, but she doesn't seem to be there anymore. So Elizabeth, if you accidentally left the queue, uh, please get back on if you if you have a question or comment. Um, so the next um, speaker is Stacy, followed by Mary Marlowe and Jackie Stansbury. Hi. Um, like some of the other callers, my family has been here actually since um, not just the 60s, but since 1939. So my point is about this is what I noticed with all the callers is that the real residents who have been in Santa Monica for most of their lives are the ones that are having a problem with the extensiveness of this project, 521 units on a large corner is sort of ridiculous. I mean, you might as well just build a gigantic office building. Um, then you're plot, you said that you're supplying 15% of those will be affordable housing. But I think to myself, okay, that's not enough. The state of California said you had to have 30%. And why on earth are you doing 521 like that gives you your bonus for this bonus thing that you need to get from the state and I'm all for improving Santa Monica but I just think that your um, project is way too big it's like look at Santa Monica there are thousands of, of apartments that are overpriced that people can't rent because they can't afford them and affordable housing for 50 units for the entire city, that's just not gonna cut it. So um, I'm curious, why did you make it 521 units? 
And also, why haven't you done the traffic study like you say you're going to do it? That should have been one of the first things that you did. And the water study, like, that should have been one of the first things you did as well. Like, you know, by you paying a fee or whatever it is to get more water, that's ridiculous. Like, we don't get to pay God for water. Like, this is the state of the reality of our world. So, um... I just wish that on the next meeting that we have, perhaps you could take actually more time to go over people's questions first and then answer them before giving your whole presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, then I'm going to find you, Mary. Mary Marlowe, um, and, that, and she will be followed by Jackie Stansbury. Um, and then I think Dave will probably want some time in there. Hi, Mary. Hi, I'm unmuted. Yes, uh, I have a, a question that I'd like answered pretty soon. I uh, live in the neighborhood in Ocean Park and like many people uh, use all the commercial businesses at Lincoln and Ocean Park. And I see that there's only going to be a small part of it in 36,000 square feet to be replaced when you're demolishing over 60,000. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, why isn't this a more balanced project, uh, particularly in light of you're adding over 500 units, which will be at least a thousand more people to use the shopping. The, the thing that I think neighbors are concerned about and feel like this is very unbalanced is that we're all gonna have to drive farther. So there won't be a dry cleaners, there won't be a pharmacy. Uh, the grocery store from the drawing I saw, 15,000 square feet, that's a 7-Eleven, that's not a grocery store. Uh, I don't know what size the restaurant will be, but, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be small. So this is not neighborhood serving commercial, especially when you're putting in a whole new neighborhood. So I'd like to understand, particularly because uh, the developer is an owner of commercial properties, why you're uh, not taking a lot more commercial properties here. The state uh, density bonus law says you can be one third commercial. This is like less than 10% commercial. So help us understand the uh, reasoning behind this because it doesn't make sense to us that, you know, don't want to drive to shop. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, uh, I'll take that. I'll, I'll, I'll answer okay. Mary's, Mary's question. So thank you. Yeah. yeah, appreciate those comments, Mary. Um, and you know, respectfully, I think we just we disagree. We think we, this is a balanced project, and we think the thirty six thousand square feet of, of commercial square footage is, is the right amount of square footage that will allow for true neighborhood serving businesses at this location. And the grocery store will be a more modern grocery store. The ownership is in conversations with a um, number of tenants that are you know well known. We don't know who it's going to be yet, but it could be a Gelson's. It could be somebody else, but. It's going to be a real viable grocery store that will be a benefit to, to the community members and, and project residents alike. And there'll be restaurants and businesses that the community can patronize. So we, we do think we have the right balance for uh, commercial uses at this location. I would say that for those of folks that are concerned about traffic, um, you know, the commercial uses generate more traffic, more trips per square footage than residential units do. Um, and so to the extent that you add more commercial square footage, you do increase traffic. Um, not saying this project isn't gonna produce any traffic, but that's, you know, that's another balancing consideration. So, um, you, you know, the, the, the ownership group is, are experts in retail and making retail successful. And they've taken a very hard look at the layout and the types of tenants, the types of uses and the amounts of square footage. And in their expert experience, expert uh, uh, knowledge and experience believe they've right-sized those uses for this location. So we do think it will be successful, um, but appreciate and understand your comments about you know, wanting more businesses and commercial uh, opportunities for neighbors to patronize. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna call on uh, Jackie Stansbury. I'll unmute you here. Hi. Um, 
So I uh, have lived in Los Angeles my entire life. And one of my favorite neighborhoods in Los Angeles next to Santa Monica is Hollywood. I don't get there very often, but I spent the afternoon in Hollywood yesterday. I see someone smirking and I know why, because what has happened to Hollywood is horrific. It is one god awful, gigantic, dense, overbuilt high rise for people with money to live in after the next. And do you know what I saw in front of every single one of those buildings? And by the way, these buildings all look exactly like the hideous high rises that are already on Lincoln Boulevard now, and that you are planning to build at the corner of Lincoln and Ocean Park Boulevard. They are upscale, dense, overbuilt buildings and camp in front of every one of those high rises in Hollywood is more homeless people than I have ever seen in my entire life. I grew up in Hollywood. I went to the punk clubs in Hollywood. There was always a handful of street people. There was never, ever, ever a homeless population. So what I would like to understand is how all of this building is aiding in the housing crisis, the one and only justification for building additional units in an overcrowded city is affordable housing for people. And yet you're building 53 affordable units that probably won't be affordable. And the fact of the matter is we have another city right here in our county where that is not working. It simply doesn't work. These units are not going to be serving the people who need to live in them. If the city of Santa Monica wants to have affordable housing, they should be building subsidized public housing and it should be dedicated to the people who need to work here but cannot afford to live here. But throwing spaghetti at the wall and saying, we're gonna have a handful of affordable units that doesn't work. And by the way, the city of Vancouver did the same exact thing. And those high rises are empty. They are investments for China. And those high rises, the units in them sit empty. And all over Vancouver, there are homeless people. So the, the idea that building more dense buildings solves the homeless problem is a lie. And then when you go to the water issue, Jackie, we're, you're at two minutes. I'm sorry. Um, we're going to need to move on. Do you want to add one thing about water, please? Uh, yeah, Which quickly, unless please. Unless you're going to like put timers on the showers in those units, how dare you talk about offsets? I don't want to have to like have low flow toilets to accommodate 500 new people that don't need to live here. Thank you, Jackie. Um, our next person is uh, Liz Hanrahan, followed by John, I don't know how to pronounce your name, last name, Ale, uh, and Andrew Apter. And maybe after Liz, um, um, we'll have, um, Dave will make some more comments. Liz, I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. Actually, this is Eugene Hanrahan. I'm using Liz's computer. Okay. Um, my question is, have any of you four individuals made donations in the last five years to any Santa Monica politician, either as individuals or through the companies that you work for? And also, Ms. Uh, Sweeney, um, did you recently work on the campaign for Glean Davis? Uh, city council member for Santa Monica. And uh, Mr. Rand, are you a partner with the law firm of Arm Brewster Goldsmith and pronounce, um, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing this, Delwac? Is that, is that correct? Could you answer those questions for me, please? Okay, we'll, we'll stop, Melissa, and we can answer sure. some questions. I want to go back to Jackie's uh, comments. Um, and and appreciate the the feedback and understand concerns about density i would take issue with comparing this project at five stories to 
Hollywood and Vine or Hollywood and Highland, where you have true high rises, or Vancouver, where you have true high rises for that matter. These are mid rise buildings. Um, I understand and appreciate that you don't think 53 very low income units is sufficient. Um, obviously, the city needs more affordable housing. Everybody believes that more affordable housing should be built. There is a difference, though, between unsubsidized affordable housing that is using no public resources, like the 53 very low income units that will be built on this site, and other higher percentage affordable projects, namely 100% affordable projects that benefit from public subsidies, from tax credits, and from a totally different financial model. So 53 unsubsidized units using no public resources as part of a single project, we don't believe is a small thing. That's almost a project within a project. It's, it's very rare. And while we could debate density, we could debate whether that's enough or not, one thing that can't be debated is your, is your comment that those won't really be affordable units. They have to be affordable units. The city imposes a, a deed restriction on the property, uh, ensuring that for 55 years, those units are at very restricted low uh, rents that can rise very minimally. And to give you an indication of exactly what that means, a studio unit in this project cannot be rented for more than $700 a unit. A one bedroom, not more than $800 a unit. A two bedroom, not more than $900 a unit. That is a substantial subsidy, not a public subsidy, but a subsidy, the private subsidy, um, for rents that you know, are well below, obviously, market rate rents in the region, let alone the city of Santa Monica. So that is a true affordability benefit locked in by legal covenant um, for the long term. Um, I, I, the next question about campaign contributions, I, I, can, I have no idea. I only can answer for myself. I haven't given anything, any contributions to anybody. I do work for the law firm of Armbrister Goldsmith and Delvec, that is my firm. I am a partner at that law firm. Um, so that is true. Um, but I think there's nothing really else to address in, in that question. I think we're caught up, Melissa. Let's take a few okay. more. Um, John, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your last name, Ale or Al. Uh, and Andrew After will follow, and Jim Bernstein will uh, follow. Uh, John, I'm unmuting you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, like to just start like Jeremy for by apologizing for my my neighbors who have decided to just scream abuse at you all night. Um, I think this looks like a great project. Um, you know, like Jeremy said, wish we could have 10, 20 more of these. Um, I just have a, a question about the bike parking. Um, is that gonna be secure bike parking um, both for uh, residents and for people just coming to visit the shopping center like I you know I live I've been living in apartments my whole life um, I've had uh, bikes stolen out of out of uh, my building's garages before like it's, it's a lot easier to justify having a bike riding a bike if I know it's not going to get stolen out of the garage uh, or you know when I'm not looking and likewise for people riding to the shopping center it's a lot easier to choose to ride your bike there if you know that the bike will still be there when you get when you get back out of the store. Thank you. Um, the next uh, speaker is Andrew Apter. I'm going to unmute you. Oh, thanks very much <laughs> for the invitation to speak. Um, um, I'm a resident. Uh, who lives between um, Euclid and 11th Street on, on Oak Street, so I'm very close. Um, we've brought three children up in the area and uh, one of them got hit by a car riding to Samo High. Uh, the police reports there, it may have been his fault. He's not a, he was reckless. Um, I'm not about, I'm not, my questions are not about that, but I just wanna say that I, I do have a, um, I will be personally affected by this project, um, but I'm not a NIMBYist. I actually, I have a broader perspective. I teach in the social sciences at UCLA and I see this as part of a systemic problem and, and uh, challenge rather than all about me. So, um, and I believe in um, respectful discourse as well. Um, my question, I have two, two questions. One is very concrete. Um, have you been in touch with Solar Santa Monica or any of the, uh, the sort of green infrastructure offices and initiatives in Santa Monica 
to at least start with something very easy and basic like putting photovoltaic cells on the roof in order to provide electricity. Personally, if you do do that, I will have a significant change of attitude toward the project. And my second question is a little more abstract. It has to do with how you as developers um, conceive of your project within a broader context. And um, this is also very important to me because from my own perspective, in terms of social systems, not in terms of where I live, um, I do believe that um, a project like this has multiplier effects that, that influence um, a range of, of environments. And without going into details, it does seem to me that there, has, there is a tipping point we're all dealing with uh, from our own vantage points, at which, which concerns the point where the benefits attached to the project are outweighed by the negatives in terms of social costs. And do you have a, an algorithm for that? Do you have a, a, an awareness of that? Independently of what the legal requirements are that you have to meet in order to promote your project. Is this something you think about? And if so, what is it? And if it isn't something you think about, do you think it's a good idea? Two questions. Thank you, Andrew. All right, let's. Um... Let's go back to John's question about bike parking first. Uh, yes, there will be secured bike parking. There's eight, going to be 829 bicycle parking spaces in the project, a substantial number of bike parking spaces. They're, one of the primary goals of this project is to be bicycle pedestrian friendly. That will include both um, ample parking for residents, but also visitor parking for commercial patrons and visitors to the residential units. So. This is go absolutely going to be a bike friendly project. Uh, moving on to Andrew's question, the first one much easier than the second. Yes, there will be solar panels on the roof. Um, Santa Monica has one of the uh, most progressive, most forward leaning sustainability um, and, and energy code, local energy code requirements in any municipality around. It, it encourages, requires solar. So that will absolutely be a feature of the project, um, as well as a number of other sustainability benefits, uh, whether it's EV charging, the water neutrality I've mentioned in the past, numerous others. Your second question is obviously a tough one, but I can tell you, having represented the residential develop development partner for this client, that they think very hard and carefully uh, before they buy properties. Uh, and, and what will it mean, not only for their business prospects as developers, but what will it mean for the surrounding community? And, you know, what does that mean? That means not looking to displace existing residents. It means looking to build sustainable projects. And you know, I fully appreciate that there are many people on this Zoom call who will not agree with what I'm about to say, but um, you know, it is well documented that building mixed income, mixed use projects, designing them well, and replacing old outdated commercial uses in surface parking lots is sustainable. It is the way to grow in the future. And that is what this project is about. And the charge of the development team uh, is to do it in a way that will be inviting for project uh, uh, patrons, a place where people want to come, they want to gather, they want to shop, want to enjoy, and a place where people want to live. And that's people of different incomes and different backgrounds. And that's obviously achieved through the project's affordability benefit. So, that's how we see the project fitting in with the broader fabric. Uh, we think, uh, and again, I know, I see the chat lighting up, people disagree, it's fine. That's, that's what this meeting is about. But you ask the question, what's our philosophy? That's our philosophy, delivering a great project that will improve the neighborhood, that will offer services, that will be designed and be attractive and address the social ills, Andrew, that you were talking about. The fact that we don't have enough housing, um, the fact that these are, requirements are in place and if you have to build housing, where are you gonna do it? This is a place where we believe it's appropriate. Melissa, do you wanna take another few callers? Yep. Um, Jim Bernstein, you're up next. I'm unmuting you, thank you. There we go, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hi, well, first of all, thank you for having the meeting. I appreciate it, even though it's required. Um, I'm not against adding um, housing, uh, especially affordable housing. I do, however, I live about three blocks from where this project will be, and I've lived in Santa Monica for 34 years, and as many other people have stated, 521 units seems insane to me. 
If you stand on the corner of Ocean Park and Lincoln at 6 p.m., the traffic is backed up from that intersection all the way back down to uh, Main Street, you know, uh, and people wait for 15 minutes to go to the light. And the same thing, if I drive down Lincoln or drive from Lincoln up to, uh, you know, um, Montana Avenue, it could take 20 minutes uh, at, at um, rush hour. So it seems insane to add this amount of um, housing. The other thing um, I believe, Dave, you said, well, uh, commercial projects use um, more, um, generate more traffic than, uh, per, you know, residential projects. There's a famous book called How to Lie with Statistics. It all depends on the density of the, of the commercial projects and the density of the residential uh, projects. So that just seems like, uh, you know, double speak. So I think my, the last thing I want to say is I feel like you guys would get a lot more support if you, and I appreciate the hearing, if you said, here's our pro proposal, we need to hear and work with the residents. And we're hearing you all say, this is too many units. Okay, maybe we should change it to 250 units. I think you'd get more support from it. Another woman said, you're just basically saying, here it is, you know, we have to have this meeting. So I, I think it's important to work with the community. And I, once again, I do appreciate the time uh, to, uh, for the feedback. Thank you, Jim. Um, next is Tim, followed by Richard Orton, followed by Ellen Hannon. And Tim, I'm going to unmute you. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, thank you. Oh, okay. <clears throat> My concern about the approval process is the public is kind of cut out of it when it comes to the, when the rubber meets the road and we have to rely upon the city <clears throat> for, to represent our interests. And the city right now, their staff is solely depleted. Their capabilities are greatly reduced. And here's a project that's going to require even greater attention and diligence to keep it on track. And so I wanna just put that out. I'm a 46 year resident and property owner of Ocean Park. I wanna just put that out that putting all the obligation on the city of looking out of all our interests uh, and cutting the public out of the approval process really makes me nervous. So thank you for having this meeting. Thank you, Tim. Um, and uh, I'm going down the list. Richard Orton, I'm going to unmute you. So I'm done. How's that? This is, Richard, this is Richard Orton. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. I've lived in Santa Monica since 1970 in Ocean Park. And I think this building is way out of scale to the, the property. I'm very much against the huge size of it. And I have a couple of little nitpicky things I wanted to ask about. <clears throat> the buildings on the south side, the six buildings there, all seem to be looking into each other's living rooms. It doesn't seem like they're very far apart and you're looking right in to the other's home. And um, my other point is the building on the corner of Ocean Park and Lincoln. It seems to me to make this place acceptable, you need open space at the corner, particularly, and it doesn't have it. It seemed like in your drawings, the building showing it's coming right up to the property line. And so I think you ought to remove that corner building. And um, I wanted to ask about dry cleaners. I use the dry cleaners there all the time. And it's right adjacent to the parking lot. The way you have structured things now, it looks like the smaller retail is quite distant from the parking lot not convenient to dropping off laundry at all. So what do you suggest about that? And the last thing would be, you show very mature trees. Have you allowed for tree wells along the property to accommodate those big trees that you show in your drawings? Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Melissa, well, so why don't we stop? And I think it would be good it. for Hank to address some of those questions relative to open space. Um, parking convenience for the commercial uses 
and um, and the landscaping plan. Yeah, and I um, can then address yeah. Jim's comments uh, about uh, the insanity of it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, Jim's comment uh, that 251 units is insane. I, I would just like to remind people the site is quite large. Uh, it's 203,000 square feet. Um, and so it can accommodate a lot of units. Uh, a lot of sites are too small to efficiently accommodate um, uh, units because the parking gets very difficult to accommodate. Um, and in terms of uh, the distribution of uh, the commercial that hasn't been determined yet where they are, uh, one of our thoughts was, hey, you know, we've got a grocery store there. Uh, if people go into the grocery store can drop off their dry cleaning while they're there, hey, guess what? That's one less trip generated. Um, the same for other stores like UPS. Uh, your, your comment about being easy to drop off, um, yeah, uh, uh, that's well taken. Um, and, and that's going to be, obviously, a dry cleaner is going to look at the convenience of drop off before they rent the store, et cetera. So that's an important retailing aspect. Um, and in terms of the open space, what we've done in this project is, you know, there's the city has a requirement for commercial buildings to be within 10 feet of the property line. Um, so what we're doing is creating that space in the middle rather than the corner. It's quite noisy at the corner, so it's not as conducive a place for people to hang out and sit. So that's the idea of the Paseo. And yes, we will be having tree wells uh, around the perimeter of the site to accommodate those trees, as well as the ones in the uh, in the Paseo. Uh, and we're going to be adding some uh, new street trees uh, where we can along Ocean Park Boulevard. It's a little bit devoid of uh, street trees at the moment. So I hope that answers the questions. Thank you, Hank. Um, I'm going to call on Ellen Hannon, then Natalia Zernitskaya, and then it looks like Gina Hass. I'm sorry if I get that wrong. Um, Ellen, I'm going to unmute you right now. Hi, I'm Ellen Hannon. I live up near uh, Wilshire and Lincoln, and I'm well uh, versed in retail properties uh, on top with housing on top of it because I've gone through all of this on the north side of, of Lincoln and the downtown area. And it does not seem to be working. And I've spoken to people in city planning and they agree with me that it is really difficult to have retail uh, underneath, directly underneath housing. Uh, the smells, the odors, the rats, the noise, the late night noise uh, really affects the people who are living and frequently leaving the apartments above them. Uh, I, I can give you a couple of examples. The corner of Colorado and Broadway is not working out. Most of those units in there are being used as Airbnb because they can't even get tenants. And I've known people who have gone in there for the low income units and they said, I'm not living here. And they go off and uh, get a small unit up on Montana area. So it, it, it's not something, and as Mary said, what about the retail, uh, the, the, the expense of the retail is so much that the smaller guys can't come in and do a little dry cleaning store because they're just not gonna make the money and dry cleaners use a lot of electricity and water. But my main concern as a public health nurse is the traffic and the safety on Lincoln Boulevard. Uh, prior to the pandemic, it is gridlocked. I always use 11th Street. I'm sorry for those poor people on 11th Street. They have to put up with all those fumes on these different hours. All of the stuff that, it's not just your project. We're gonna see more and more of these coming down Lincoln on both sides of these huge projects, making more and more traffic. It's not going anywhere. The freeway is there. People are going to the freeway. It's going to be gridlocked most of the time. All of those fumes are going up into those apartments because they're too close to the road. People riding their bicycles are gonna be infusing those uh, fumes into their lungs. Uh, there's no open space between the sidewalk. The sidewalk is too small. There needs to be some kind of bike lane there. There are no buses on Lincoln. They, they rarely ride. They rarely uh, commute like once an hour and they don't go anywhere. So uh, there's no, uh, so that's my problem. But I'm gonna give you an example of the gridlock. I was coming down at four o'clock in the afternoon on Lincoln 
I got just about to where I, the freeway was. It was gridlocked in every single direction with the train coming up and down behind me. And what pulls up behind me, I could not move in any direction, gridlock going in every direction, but the fire truck right behind me with the siren blaring, blaring, blaring. There was no place for us to go. I sat through three lights with that blaring behind me. And I just feel sorry for anyone who's living in those apartments who are gonna be sitting there looking at that gridlock every evening and every morning. And this Ellen, is- Ellen, you're at two place. minutes. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just wanna no tell problem. you, this is reality. You people are not looking at reality. You give me a beautiful view, uh, Tank. I like your design, it's beautiful, it's too big, and maybe you belong somewhere else. Try putting it up by the airport. They're going to be doing a lot of building up there in the next few years. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you very much. Let's take one more, Melissa, and then I'll address Ellen. Peter Oak. Comments. Hold on. Yeah. Um, I'm going to unmute Natalia Zernitskaya. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share my input. So uh, first, I just wanted to say I'm really excited about this project because we really need housing in Santa Monica. We really need housing all across California. And this is in a location that does not ex displace existing residents, which is honestly uh, my favorite part about this project in addition to it being a lot of housing. Um, I did have a couple of questions though. The first one is about parking. So 880 parking spots for cars seems like it's too much for um, a project like this, especially when it's on two major thoroughfares, <clears throat> excuse me, and have high quality bus lines. Um, so how did you get this to this number? And is there any way that the total number of parking spots could be reduced? Uh, my other question is about whether this will require a transportation demand management plan and um, how you're going to encourage people to use bikes and multimodal transportation and reduce their our, de our dependence on cars. Um, and then two more questions, sorry. Um, will the building be dog friendly? Because that's very important to me. Um, and I know that modern building um, codes have changed and building materials have changed throughout the years. And I'm really lucky to be able to live in Santa Monica in a rent controlled home. Uh, but my apartment building is extremely old and I can literally hear like every step my upstairs neighbors take. Uh, so I was just wondering how you're going to um, make the building friendly for the tenants to live in? Like, what's the soundproofing going to be like? Um, or is there anything that you have at this time that you can share with us? Because uh, I know it's still very early in the process, and I'm sure a lot of things haven't been decided yet. Um, so that's all my questions. Thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Natalia. Okay, let me go back, I guess, generally, thematically to, to, to Jim and Ellen Hannon's comments. So mainly about the number of 521 units and and uh, and, and congestion. And um, 521 is a big number. It's, it's a big project. It's a large number. But when we think of density, um, it's a function of not only the number, but the size of the lot. And to Hank's point, this is a huge property. This project is actually less dense than the projects you're referencing along Lincoln Boulevard and along many of the commercial boulevards, because there's just the lot area to accommodate this kind of project. So given the location, we think while 521 units is a big number, it's appropriate given it's a uniquely sized property in the city of Santa Monica. And yes, there is congestion. Yes, there is traffic. Anyone who uh, you know says otherwise obviously is not living in reality, but where's the traffic coming from and why does it exist? The traffic is coming from the 10 freeway with people pouring into town to work in Santa Monica who don't live in Santa Monica. There's a jobs housing imbalance in the city. And the way you rectify and address jobs housing imbalance is to build more housing. Instead of building more commercial uses on a commercial property, you build mixed use housing and try to build a project that will reduce trips, that will have what we call a technical term internal capture, residents using the commercial uses um, and, and taking cars off the road. Uh, to Natalia's point, you impose transportation demand management strategies 
to encourage bike parking, transit passes, multimodal use. You make it bike friendly and ped friendly. And all those things will absolutely be part of the project. To address Natalia's parking question, parking is obviously a very important issue community wide, but also for the developer. Developers of multifamily mixed use buildings have to get the parking right. If you don't get the parking right, you either do one of two things. If you build too much parking, you spend a lot of money because parking is extraordinarily expensive. And so it makes no sense to build more than what you need. If you underpark the project, then people are not going to want to live there and the project is not going to work. And so that's a disaster. So a great deal of time and attention goes into on the development of a project like this in understanding the market, the demographic, the area, and right-sizing the parking. And here believe, we believe we have done that. The parking the project does have um, you know, a substantial number of parking spaces, 910 vehicle parking spaces in total. It's for the commercial and the residential. The, but we're sort of, we believe we've hit the sweet spot between parking actually below the city codes that apply to the boulevards, but in excess of the reduced parking ratios that would be permitted by the state density bonus law. So we think we've right-sized that amount such that there will be adequate parking, there won't be spillover parking impacts to the surrounding neighborhood, and tenants will have the parking they need, uh, but the project will not be overparked to, to produce unnecessary vehicular trips that wouldn't, you know, wouldn't could otherwise be avoided. Melissa, let's take a few more questions. Okay, do, um, I think this is Gina Haas, but I'm not sure. Followed by Yolande and Lou. Um, so uh, I'm unmuting you. Hi, Melissa. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you got it right. It's Gina Haas. I'm not opposed to a project on the corner of Lincoln and Ocean Park. In fact, I'm a favor of the project. However, I am opposed to this project. It's three stories too tall, 400 units too many, and represents a parking challenge and traffic problem. Statements and rationale in support of this project are inaccurate. While the intent is commendable, the outcome will have a harsh impact on longstanding residents. Given the hillside location, entrance and exit to the property is limited, a correct tra traffic flow assessment is required and will show that we are already overloaded. Those that own homes on Hill Street between Lincoln and about 21st will be severely impacted. Someone commented that this is a great project if in the correct place. Lincoln and Ocean Park is an inappropriate location for the density and traffic and will result in inequities to current homeowners of Sunset Park. We need to have transparent information, correct assessments, and an empathy for the negative impact of the people that will have work and that have worked hard to make this community safe and peaceful. Dave, you mentioned the administrative approval process. Please comment first, please comment on who is involved in this process. Is it an internal Santa Monica City departmental review? Second, please comment on the timeline for this. Third, and finally, please describe how the viewpoints of those opposed are equitably assessed and there is transparency to the public. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I'll move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Yolande, I think is how you pronounce your name. Um, I'm unmuting you and you'll be followed by Lou and Kathy. Okay, hi, I'm just going to uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, all your answers. I think overwhelmingly there seems to be a real concern with the traffic and that Ocean Park around Lincoln turns into one lane go, going to the beach, that there are on uh, Lincoln and Broadway and Colorado, there are duplicate apartments that you're planning to build now that were not there where Michael's were. We have a already on 4th Street, on Lincoln, and 26. Those exits on 10 are already halfway down the freeway. 
and you just have this whole and that's not even on a uh, on a summer on a summer with the amount of tourists that Santa Monica wants to bring into the city. It cannot be just, we're going to review it. This is really, really, really a serious problem. Lincoln is a nightmare. You know, it, it's already there. That, the traffic is already there. You really, it would have to be a whole re-engineering, 11th, maybe putting in an exit and an entrance. I mean, we go from seventh to 26th on 10 without any ent enters or en entry or exits. And you're thinking of putting in at least, at least a thousand to 2000 people along with cars in that area. And you just can't overlook it. it it's been running through this whole conversation, it cannot be just, oh, we'll take it in review. This is what people are up in. If you come up with some sort of real intelligent, how are we gonna deal with this? I think people of how they look at this will be different because you're gonna make a nightmare for the people who live here. Okay, let me go back to answer Gina Haas's questions. Um, uh, with respect to process. So as I mentioned, it's an administrative approval application process. Um, an application first needs to be submitted to the city. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, again, we are at the earliest, earliest point in the process. That application includes um, a write-up of, of the community meeting, and we're going to go beyond that, and we're going to submit each and every one of the comments that the myriad of comments that have appeared in the chat tonight as part of the application. So the city has that. The AA, the AA, the administrative approval process is extensive and thorough in terms of city departmental review of the project. So the planning department reviews the requests, the density bonus requests, they review for code compliance, the mobility division reviews for traffic, for circulation, for safety, the public works department reviews for uh, the surrounding streets and for infrastructure related issues. The sustainability division reviews solar, EV charging, all of the city's compliance with the city's green codes. Uh, the trash division reviews RRNR, reviews how the trash will be picked up and making sure that's it. So, and it goes on and on. So it's not a quick process. It's you know, at least a year, if not more, of city vetting um, and will culminate in a public hearing or potentially multiple public hearings with respect to the design of the project before a citizen appointed body called the Architectural Review Board. Uh, those are folks appointed by members of the city council who sit and um, review the design of, of certain projects. And they will make changes and they'll impose conditions. Uh, and that in and of itself is a, is a pretty thorough exacting process. So this is, this is extensive. This is not a, you know, we file something, we get a building permit and you're gonna see construction occurring in your neighborhood in the next couple of months. Uh, based on, you know, anticipated timeframes, both through the administrative approval process and also the building permit process, which is another extensive set of reviews by city officials, we expect construction to commence and this is rough because, of course, we don't control these timelines. These are, you know, these are city processes. But we expect the timeline to be roughly two years or more, two and a half years, before construction could commence. It's likely going to take um, you know, two and a half, three years to build a project like this. So we're five plus years away um, from this project uh, coming to reality. So again, not a tomorrow kind of thing, and we are only starting at the very outset of the process. So. Gina Haas, I hope I answered those questions um, with respect to how the process works and the timeline. Melissa? Thanks, Dave. Um, next is Lou, followed by Kathy Knight and Jay Wilson. I'm gonna uh, unmute you, Lou. Hi, Lou. I sent a uh, request to unmute. If you can unmute oh. yourself. Okay, there it is. Uh, yes. There, great. 
Okay, thank you. Yes, um, I don't have a car, so I take the number eight bus, which goes up and down Ocean Park Boulevard, and I see what uh, almost three days a week what goes on on that in that area and up and down it sideways. Um, yeah, for me, my quality of life would be terribly uh, impacted by losing that um, little shopping area. It's got a po it serves my postal needs. It's got a dry cleaner. It's got a pharmacy for medication. It's got food for my belly. It's got restaurants. Um, it's near, uh, just a one-stop shop. And now that the bus system is, um, this are fewer buses, everything takes longer to do. So to lose all those places that have survived recessions, those stores have um, survived COVID. So they're obviously a need for this community. Uh, those stores, I, they probably would never be able to come back. Uh, with the type of um, upscale place you seem to, to want to build. And as to the bike situation, somebody else mentioned it, that Ocean Park Boulevard uh, is extremely steep. Uh, you almost need to be um, Lance Armstrong on steroids to get up and down that hill. So I don't think you're going to be bringing a lot of cyclists in. Um, so that means cars and... Uh, so, and the way it looks, I think aesthetically, it could be anywhere USA. I don't think it has a lot of anything to um, draw the eye to it, to make it interesting or unique. It's very brutalist almost. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just too big and um, too ugly. We don't really need it. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Lou. Uh, I'm going down the list again. I'm sorry. Uh, Kathy Knight is next. I'll um, unmute you. Okay. Yeah. I'm Kathy Knight. I've lived in the area for 30 years. And um, I, I think this will really, really change our lives here. Um, I love the open space uh, and being able to walk to Gelson's a few blocks away and just have an open space. I love that. And to be just crammed in everywhere, um, I, I don't like that at all. Um, so, and also, um, Santa Monica is already one of the most densely populated cities in all of LA County, and we don't need to make it more overcrowded here in Santa Monica. And one of the issues I have a, a, a concern about that a lot of people have brought up is um, the, the traffic. How many, I like to know the statistics, like how many more car trips a day, um, if you have 910 parking spaces, how many more car trips a day will there be? And what are the impacts going to be on Lincoln and Ocean Park Boulevard. I hear you're gonna do some kind of traffic this or this, but it doesn't sound like a really serious traffic study that developments usually have to do when they're developing something. So I, we really need a clear, clear traffic study. And my third question is, um, how, how long would it be taking, um, I think you said two to three years to tear down what's there now and and then um, develop, um, how, how long would it take to tear it down and then how long to build? And what would you do? I mean, how much um, pollution would there be in the air uh, coming in around the neighborhood with such a gigantic, huge development being done? Um, I mean, I see what's done, the dust that comes just from somebody changing something on their house in the neighborhood, just one house. How are you gonna prevent any pollution coming from all of this huge tear down and building? How are you gonna keep the pollution out of the neighborhood and what kind of pollution also would it be? Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, our next speaker is Jay Wilson. I'm going to unmute you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
Great. Hi, my name is James Wilson. I'm a native to Santa Monica. I've lived here all my life, 63 years, and my family lived here before that in the Sunset Park area. I've sat on commissions with the city of Santa Monica, and I think 65 feet is very high for this neighborhood. I have to agree with a lot of the people. Um, I'm also an architect, by the way. Um, I believe that, you know, there should be some way to break down that mass um, as we approach the streets to a more pedestrian scale. I believe we should also break down that mass on the east and the south property lines of the property, again, to help it to ease the impact on the neighbors. Um, by the way, what's the unit mix? I haven't heard anything about the unit mix. Um, and then the other thing is that retail is what will benefit this neighborhood the most. Um, and that I feel is a little under designed. It's not really inviting people in. Again, breaking down that mass and allowing more sunlight to get down to that paseo is gonna make it a much more pleasant place to be. If it's just uh, five stories on each side and a deep canyon, it's gonna be dark all day long and it won't be a very nice place to go and, and visit. So it won't be successful in that sense. So um, again, yeah, traffic, um, Ocean Park, is there any talk about widening the streets along Ocean Park and Lincoln in the area of the pro project um, to give back something to help ease that uh, impact that it will have? Because it will have an impact. Um, so I guess those are my questions. Um, the unit mix, look at designing it so that you can step back as you go up so that the impact is not as great to the, uh, to the neighborhood. And uh, um, Parking, oh, that's another one. Automated parking, have you looked at automated parking? Um, that way you reduce the amount of uh, area that you need to park those vehicles. And maybe that way you can reduce the size and impact of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, let me answer a couple of questions. First, Kathy's got concerns about pollution. I, I gathered mainly from construction. And uh, Kathy, there, to, when you build a project like this, the there are several different regulatory agencies that have oversight over it and impose a series of requirements to make sure that construction impacts, uh, noise, dust, air quality related issues are are mitigated and reduced to the fullest extent possible. So, uh, the South Quality uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District (SCAQMD) has a series of rules and regulations that need to be adhered to, um, where dust needs to be minimized. Um, and you know, construction needs to be handled as sensitively as possible uh, to avoid impacts in, to the neighborhood. The city of Santa Monica also has a number of requirements in, in that regard. Um, construction is inherently disruptive, and and you know that that's you know that's just reality. It also is you know short term and does not go on forever. Um, so the city and the, the local air district regulate those to try and, and reduce those things as, as, as much as possible. This developer has worked with the community and the city on other projects where they will be a, you know, a point person, a liaison for the community to interface with during construction. So, um, you know, if there are acute concerns that neighbors have, certain things that sometimes happen during construction, there's a point of contact. So. Um, someone can address those issues and, you know, the neighbors have someone to call, basically. Um, operationally, a project like this, and again, I, you know, uh, there'll be folks that disagree, but it's well documented that these kinds of mixed income, mixed use boulevards located near transit on, on, on the boulevards actually reduce pollution. They reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The vehicular trip lengths are shorter, meaning less pollutants in the air resulting from car trips and, you know, more um, um, encouragement of clean modes of transportation, bicycles, pedestrians, and, and what have you. So um, there are sustainability benefits, as we talked about earlier in the call, to doing a project like this, which we do believe in. Um, the next caller had a question about the unit mix. That one we can certainly answer. The, of the 521 units is comprised of 91 studio units, 220, 229 one-bedroom units, and 201 two bedroom units. Uh, that's the overall unit mix. And then the um, affordable unit mix will be proportionate and mirror the unit mix of the market rate units. Um, so there'll be a parity there. Um, 
Automated parking is complicated um, for small and uncomplicated projects, and and you know this is a large larger project, and so on. You know, on, it would be, I think, logistically very difficult uh, to do uh, automated parking at this location. And one of the key key uh, objectives of the project is user friendly parking, not only for residents but also for commercial patrons to make sure the grocery works and is inviting and is you know friendly and usable and so we think traditional parking uh, lends itself to a better experience for both patrons and residents and uh and that's why that strategy has been employed on the project as opposed to some of the newer technologies like like an automated system melissa dave, dave could yep, i just please. jump there please was a couple, couple of questions uh one was about um the noise i think uh, alan mentioned noise of uh, Lincoln and then Nat Natalia mentioned uh, noise within the units. Um, first of all, we'll have an acoustic study done. The noise levels on Lincoln and Ocean Park will be analyzed uh, and that will determine what level of uh, acoustic windows we'll require and whether we will need, uh, there's a thing called Z-Ducts that we used on the, uh, the Belmar project to allow outside air in but it goes through a sound baffling device so you don't get a lot of noise. So you still get outside ventilation um, uh, into your building. And typically we place those on the interior side of the building, not next to the road. Um, and then there's very stringent codes now about noise uh, between units. Um, and as far as I know that, that, that this is gonna be a dog friendly um, project, uh, we've talked about having like dog wash stations within the building um, so that people can use that and not have to uh, scratch up the bathtubs. Thank you, Hank. Thanks, Sab. We'll move on. Um, the next uh, speaker is, I think, Sumia Naidu. Naidu. Oh, did I click the wrong person? Melissa, can you do you have a sense of how many raised hands are remaining? We are thirty-seven. Thirty-seven. Okay, we're closing in on the two-hour mark. But as we promised, we will uh, go as long as everybody, uh, as, so everybody has an opportunity to make a comment or ask. A okay, question. I'm just trying to. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to. I find where Sumia went. Uh, so, uh, but it looks like um, Helene is on. I don't know where these have gone. There you are. There you should get a, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself, Helene. Hi, thank you. I didn't really have a question. I put my question in the, in the chat and I believe you answered it. My, most of my questions have been answered, well, have been asked, not really answered. Just like many people really concerned about traffic and I think a study should be done during high tourist season, not at our lowest point. I think we need to do that, especially since we are right by the beach. I think it's really important to understand the traffic impact um, at our tourist season time. Uh, also, the water supply, I really don't understand what you're talking about with offsets, so that I think you need to explain better at your next meeting. And you talked about noise impact on the, on the residents of the actual project, but what about the noise impact on the residents who live around the project? Um, I hear a lot of traffic noise. I live up on Highland Avenue, and I hear a lot of noise from Lincoln Boulevard, so I'm curious of 520 units, possibly another thousand residents living on the corner. What kind of noise impact that's gonna have um, up here on Highland and the surrounding area. And I'm also concerned that if part of this is about affordable uh, units, why there aren't more. Um, you certainly, if I know that the state has asked the city of Santa Monica to find 8,000 affordable units in the next couple of years. I know that's a tall order. And certainly your 50 some units will be helpful in that completing that project. But if this really is about having affordable housing for the community, um, 
then I think you should increase your numbers. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Helene. Um, our next question is, questions are from, uh, our comments from Graham Rigby. I'm unmuting you. Graham. Here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Graham Rigby. Um, I'm an Ocean Park resident. Um, live very close to this project um, and walk to the Gelsons for groceries from time to time. Um, I just wanted to um, second what some other people had said before um, that I really strongly support this project. Um, this is a much, much better use of the lot than it's used now. Uh, we can house a lot of people and there's a terrible, terrible housing shortage in Santa Monica and in the state of California at large. Um, every community needs to do its part to make sure we have enough housing in the state of California. Santa Monica can't be an exception. Um, and it's actually especially important here where there are so many jobs and opportunities and a lot of people want to live, which is why the rent is so, so expensive. Um, the only solution is to build more housing. And I really appreciate uh, the work you've all done to make this a beautiful use of the space. Thank you so much. Thank you, Graham. Um, our next speaker is Max, followed by Karen Taylor and Ann Hoover. Hi there. Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for having the meeting and uh, and for accepting so many comments. Uh, I want to say that I empathize with some of the with some of the speakers. Uh, Briar, um, I understand they often want um, Santa Monica to be the be the community they grew up in. Um, and I, I want to say a couple of things. Firstly, a, a message to them that I don't think it's possible to freeze Santa Monica in time. Um, just stopping building housing doesn't mean changes don't happen. If we don't build housing, then existing housing gets bid up in price. Uh, it's just not possible to have a have a, a sparsely built community by the ocean in the heart of LA that's also reasonably affordable. So I wanted to also ask um, you uh, for what for residents who are keen on this being built and are generally keen for more housing to be in Santa Monica, what we could do to uh, to support the project. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, our next speaker is Karen Taylor, followed by Ann Hoover and um, Aaron S. Karen. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I was curious to hear more about the administrative approval process and um, if you could help us all understand what it means, what's the alternative to that? Obviously there must be a benefit to you as developers of this project to have, an, have it under that heading. So it'd be in the interest of transparency um, for us to know how that benefits you and what it leaves out of the process for residents of Santa Monica. So if you could um, elaborate on that, that'd be great. Sure, why don't, we, why don't we stop there and I'll, I'll take that. So the streamlined process that is the administrative approval um, was a, a essentially a function um, and I want to be very clear here, I'm not, I, I, again, I don't speak for the city, but it, it, the creation of the process was a function of the fact that these housing, these types of predominantly housing projects that comply with state law, that comply with code, and that may or may not use density bonus incentives, uh, effectively cannot be denied under state law, absent extraordinarily unique conditions. And those conditions are not traffic and, you know, um, design and things of that sort. Uh, they're very high bar, high bar 
conditions. And so the city determined that based on number one, it's extraordinary housing demands that were being placed upon it by the state. Uh, and two, the fact that state laws essentially prevent municipalities from denying these kinds of housing projects, that it did not make sense to subject them to a longer, more extensive review process. Karen, the alternative is a development review permit. That's another type of entitlement that requires public hearings and you know more process. Um, and so these projects were effectively streamlined. Um, and that, that is the difference between some of the other processes that exist and the administrative approval. But as I've said multiple times tonight, that does not mean that the administrative approval process is some quick over the counter, you know, one and done issuance of a permit. It is very detailed and very extensive in all the ways I've already disclosed to you tonight. And it's time consuming. So th that, you know, it is, it is I, I guess I would say streamlined in a relative sense, but by no means is it, does it result in SNAP approvals or lacks oversight in terms of the projects and its impacts and implications to the city and the neighborhood and everything else. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm going to unmute Ann Hoover, followed by Aaron and Godfrey. Uh, Ann. Great, can you hear me? Yes. Right, hi, I'm Ann Hoover, and um, I participated with Hank and Dave and possibly Melissa in the city's housing production technical working group when they were putting together the housing element. And so a little earlier tonight, Dave mentioned the 9,000 unit requirement that the state wants us to build between now and 2029. That's called the six cycle RENA. So I want to parse that number of those 9,000 units, the vast majority we're supposed to build well, are well over 6,000 units that are either affordable or low income. Only 2,000 and a little change of that 9,000 number are supposed to be market rate. And as of a year ago, based on what city staff confirmed, based on what already is in the pipeline, as of a year ago, we only needed to build 890 market rate units by 2029 to be six cycle compliant for market rate. Obviously in the past year, more market rate units have entered the pipeline. We may, be, we may even now be beyond what we need to build for market rate um, to be compliant, to meet the state's requirement seven years from now. Um, add on to that, and this is also confirmed by city staff, we have a 7% vacancy rate in Santa Monica right now. That's 4,500 units, most of which are market rate and they are vacant. So we can talk about a jobs housing imbalance, but people are driving into Santa Monica because they can't afford to live here. Otherwise those units would be full. So for everyone on the call, all we need to build in Santa Monica is housing that is affordable for people. And this project doesn't do it. We, uh, as Jeremy said, oh, we need 10 or 20 more of these. No, we don't. We only need to figure out a way to build housing that people can afford. So I'd like to hear from Hank and Dave and Allison and Melissa why we need this market rate project that's gonna suck resources, put several small businesses out of business and be bad for the neighborhood. We don't need market rate housing. So folks, why do we need this project? Thank you. Thanks, Ann. Well, um, we obviously, Ann, disagree that, that additional housing is, is, is a drain on resources and not a good thing for community. Um, additional housing of all types is needed. The, one of the reasons that housing is so expensive is that there is a shortage of supply and increasing supply in, in housing production has a effect on pricing. Um, and, and look, the city has strategies, as you know, Anne, to address the affordable housing crisis. Uh, you're, you're correct that the preponderance of units that are required under the housing element RENA process are affordable. Um, and this project is contributing to them by providing, again, the 53 unsubsidized units that come with no public resources. The city has dedicated public land through the housing element process for the production of 100% affordable housing projects. And that's because the city recognizes that those types of projects need subsidy. 
whether they need direct infusion of resources, which is hard to come by, or land. And so the city has, you know, rather amazingly, actually, uh, giving, given the municipalities don't typically do this, set aside some of its most precious property resources for the production of 100% affordable housing. And then there are uh, affordable housing providers that will build 100% affordable projects um, that obtain other kinds of benefits, both subsidies, tax credits, and greater density bonuses, significantly greater density bonuses and incentives than you're seeing in this project to allow those projects to be feasible. So it's a balance. And you know we would say that we need housing of, of all types, and that's a good thing. And it's not as if this is just an all housing project with no commercial, as we talked about, there will be businesses coming back to this site. Uh, and we believe they will be um, a great benefit to the community. So appreciate your comments, uh, but you know, on some of those points, Dan, we, we just have to agree to disagree. Thanks, I'm going to unmute Aaron and uh, after him, Godfrey and after him, uh... Bradley Ewing. Aaron, I'm going to uh, ask you to unmute. Hi, thanks for the chance to comment here. Uh, two things quickly. First, Dave Rand, you made a peculiar comment that you would put in a viable gel grocery store. Gelson's is definitely a viable grocery store. You should consider going inside. Next thing, we've talked about the traffic, but I don't feel we've adequately addressed it. Some people have put it in the chat that this intersection is the second most dangerous in the city. I would like all four of you to acknowledge, and if that's not true, please comment. Uh, I am a homeowner and I have a child. I live just uh, west of Lincoln Boulevard. And what happens already with the traffic is people swerve off Lincoln Boulevard and go barreling down these other streets, not looking at the road, looking at their ways, looking at their map apps. Uh, this is dangerous, of course. Allison, you mentioned you cared about the community. If you do, I hope you'll comment. We've seen people, we've seen car accidents. We've seen people get struck uh, on bicycles, get struck by cars. Uh, so this project is certain to exacerbate the traffic problem. There's just no way around it. So if you would kindly acknowledge what I've said, whether you agree or not, and then I would love for you to respond. Thank you. Again, appreciate those comments. Here, the concerns over traffic and circulation loud and clear. Um, and as I again, as I've said, I'm, I'm acknowledging your comment, Aaron. And and again, we will have to work with the city on addressing exactly those concerns. Um, the city is well aware of of the segments and intersections that pose the greatest danger throughout the city. So their review for projects that are being proposed in intensifying areas in and around those, those types of intersections is, is gonna be more exacting and more probing and more involved. And so, you know, again, that's why this doesn't happen overnight. That's why it's a year plus process. And a big part of that is the mobility division and their review over the traffic and circulation effects that we are as an applicant studying as well. So that is all part of this process, but we acknowledge and hear your concerns and thank you for commenting. Dave, if I could just jump in real quick, there's been a handful of comments about how the retail will continue to serve the community. And, and yes, today it is 60,000 square feet, but as I mentioned earlier, 60,000 square feet, part of that is a 40,000 square foot box that's really too big for a grocery store in today's world. And if you walk into any of the newer, be it Gelson's grocery stores, Trader Joe's, you name it, many of them are, are going smaller because they've learned more efficient ways to operate their business and still serve the needs of the community. So just by way of example, if our plan is proposing a 15,000 square foot grocery, um, another example of what that looks like would be a typical Trader Joe's is about 12,000 square feet. Um, Bob's supermarket down the street is actually also about 12,000 square feet. Um, so I just kind of wanted to provide that for a little bit of context so that people can understand that even if it's 36 to 46,000 square feet of retail, really appreciate hearing the comments tonight about the type of retailers that you guys like to use and who you'd like to see in this project ultimately, um, be because we do think that in more efficient space, we can still have a great mix of uses like the ones that you're naming um, that will, will still meet your daily needs. Thanks, Allison. Um, I'm going to unmute uh, Godfrey followed by Bradley Ewing and Art. So Godfrey, I'm going to ask you to unmute. 
Hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Godfrey Washira, and I'm with uh, Creed LA. Um, I think so far, thank you for the presentation. I think this is a potentially very good project. Yeah, I think we need both market rate and affordable housing. Uh, as guys as a group, we really have an interest in the advancement of a safe and skilled construction workforce as a community benefit. Uh, do you guys have any plans to provide this benefit, at least to complement the affordable housing uh, community benefit? Thank you. Thank you, Godfrey. Um, Bradley, you're on deck. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Uh, I just wanted to call uh, in support of this project. Whoops. I apologize. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, cool, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to call in support of this project. Uh, I've been a resident here for many years over in the Wilshire, Montana neighborhood. And I, I really wanted to like echo and hammer on what, what Dave was saying earlier about the benefits of infill density because that is my personal lived experience. I used to commute 50, 50 miles one way to my job here in Santa Monica. And I was able to find an apartment that I could afford and change that to a walking commute. And now like I'm lucky if I put more than 15 miles on my odometer month over month. And so and in addition to that, like I think the fact that you're building hundreds of units like within the immediate proximity to a grocery store in addition to the other units that are surrounding the neighborhood is incredibly, incredibly important and good. Uh, I live less than a block from a grocery store today and it is such a huge boost to my quality of life to be able to like just walk over to the grocery store to be able to get groceries and to run other errands. Um, I've seen the majority of my friends and family uh, you know, that I've grown up with, like pushed out of, you know, Southern California and California in general due to the housing shortage. And so, you know, it's a very personal issue to me. Really happy to see a project of this size coming to the lot. You know, I pass that lot every week biking down Ocean Park. I think it's a huge eyesore. We need, you know, I think dozens more of these types of projects. I would love to see something like this uh, happen at the pavilions that I live next to over in Wilmot. Uh, I just have one quick question. Uh, when you guys are doing development on the Ocean Park uh, side of the parcel, I do wonder if it would be possible for you guys to implement or improve the bike lane that's there, I ideally create some sort of protected bike lane. I, I imagine that would need some more coordination with the city, uh, but just those sharrows tend to not really be uh, you know, enjoyable or really safe to ride in. Uh, and you know it's a it's a really huge issue for those of us who are you know trying to get around in a in a sustainable and healthy way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bradley. Um, next uh, speaker is Art. I'm unmuting you. Thank you for taking my comments. I am a 50 year resident of Sunset Park. I shop at Gelson's. I go to the eye doctor in that development and I use the UPS store. I'm concerned about the height of the project. It seems two stories too high. Several of the speakers tonight or chat people or architects. Before the comments from them are given to the city council, I would like payment disclosure from all firms involved in this project. Will you agree not to pay the speakers to make favorable comments about the project? Hold on a second, I, hold, on a, hold on a second. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you there. There is no one who has been paid to make any kind of comments on this project. That is not something that happens. We, we don't, people are making damn. comments based on, on, on their opinions and they're all welcome whether you hate this project, whether you love this project, no. or whether you're agnostic, no one is getting paid to make any comments this evening. So Dan, or, or at any will point. all the firms involved in this project agree not to pay any of the speakers tonight or at any of the community meetings? Yes, agreed. Who made comments now agreed. or in the future? Agreed. Lastly, I, agreed, agreed, Art. Agreed. yes, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. I also asked for a traffic study. Ocean Park is gridlock by 3 p.m. I can't leave my house after 3 p.m. if I want to go a mile. I can't go to Gelson's after 3 p.m. So I, I know Hank has an office on, on um, 
Broadway near the Helen Cycle. Where do all of you live? Do you not understand the impact of this project you're proposing? I assume you live far away. I'd really like to understand in disclosure of the City Council, where, how many miles from this project do each of you live? Thank you very much for accepting my comments tonight. Thank you, Art. Um, our next commenter is um, Kelsey, followed by Carrie, and then Larry. Kelsey, go ahead. Hi, thank you. I have three quick questions. Um, as the previous uh, speaker said, yeah, I'm an architect. Um, I want to know, do you have any outside play yards for the children who will be living in this project? Are you hoping to get any kind of environmental certification from LEED, the L-E-E-D, Envir environmental certification? And what is your strategy for security here? How are you going to keep people feeling safe in this project? Will there be on-site security guards. You mentioned 800 bicycle parking. You put 800 bikes in an enclosure and one team with a truck and some bolt cutters can steal a hundred at one go. So what's your security strategy? That's it, thanks, bye. Thank you. Um, our Nick, next... you wanna take those? Oh, go ahead. Sure, sure. Um... A couple of things I'll, I'll go back to. Somebody mentioned, um, I think it was Jay Wilson, about uh, breaking down the massing to the neighbours. Uh, we are respecting the daylight plane requirement that's in the zoning ordinance. And that, that takes a, a vertical line from the centre of the alley up 25 feet and then angles at 45 degrees. Um, and that's, I, I think that's a great one of the great uh, uh, requirements in, that came out of the loose. Uh, so that gives daylight uh, light near to, to adjoining residential uh, properties. So, um, and then in, in regard to uh, play space, uh, yes, we're gonna be incorporating play space into the project, um, both for adults with the pool area and a gym and all those sort of amenities, but also uh, kid play space. Um, lead certification, not sure. Um, what we're finding, most of our projects um, end up uh, going for a lead gold and end up getting platinum uh, because the Title 24 requirements and Cal Green now kind of get you into that position. So um, certainly it will be at least a lead gold uh, equivalent uh, there, or there, may, there are other systems in, uh, around besides lead, such as the well building Etc. So we're not sure if they're going to do a certification or just an equivalence. Security is a big concern. I have heard of so many, so many problems in the Galson's parking lot. What we've got now is by moving the parking back, it's undercover, it's at the same level. This project will have cameras. It'll be much more difficult for people to come in and um, and do all sorts of nefarious things. The bike parking will be distributed and locked both within the secure garage and there will be locked uh, bike compounds, not all in one spot, but distributed uh, around the project, both for the commercial bicyclists. And we're hoping there'll be some of those who, who ride their bike to work, providing showers for them and then uh, uh, for the residents. So I hope that addresses some of the questions. If any I missed there, Dave, you call, do you recall? I think that uh, covers it. Okay, moving on to Carrie uh, Letterer, followed by Larry and then Nathan Dean. Um, Carrie, I'm gonna unmute you. Hi, thank you. This is actually Matt, Matt and Carrie. So we live one block away from Gelson's. Um, I th there's been a lot of things said here. I, I'm not gonna repeat some of the things that a lot of the residents have said, but I think we all recognize that one of the big value propositions of, of the property is that it's to address a shortage of housing. So what I'd like to ask are questions around that goal. So um, do you have anything in place to uh, monitor occupancy sort of of by residents of these units? I mean, are, are we gonna have Airbnbs there? Are, are there gonna be a lot empty that are third and fourth homes for wealthy people? That's question number one. 
if there's something in place for that, or we can expect to see the trends that we've seen everywhere in the country. Um, the second question is, is there any monitoring of how this has affected the rents and, and the rate of increase in rents in Santa Monica in the future with penalties for the developer if they don't reduce the average rents? Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me take that, um, Melissa, just to- Okay. I wanna make a couple of things clear. <clears throat> First of all, the city has Airbnb ordinances in place that prohibit Airbnbs. So that, that's, that's not uh, allowed to happen uh, at this property. Uh, secondly, the city council, um, not that long ago, let's say about a year ago, adopted an ordinance for all multifamily buildings like this uh, that requires that the tenants in the building occupy the unit as their primary place of residence and lease the unit for a minimum of a one-year term. And the idea for that is to, behind that, is to ensure um, that, you know, these, these units are being actually rented by individuals, uh, addressing the housing shortage, in, improving that, you know, increasing the housing stock to meet the objectives of the project, not for corporate rentals or short-term rentals or, you know, second, third homes that people occupy for a week out of a year. So th th that those regulations govern will absolutely govern this project, and I think address address those concerns. And, and to your second point, uh, there, I mean, the answer is no. There's no penalty um, in place in this municipality or any other that I am aware of in the state of California or in the country that penalize developers if the rents go up. It's a function of the market with respect to the market units. With the affordable units. There is a program in place, a very strict program that the city has that mandates that the units be occupied, that they be occupied only by in, in, income eligible individuals and households. And for these units, that's people making 50% of the area median income. Um, give you a sense of that. That's uh, for a two person household, two, two person household making about $47,000 three-person household making about $53,000. And that is annually monitored, enforced, and strict penalties are in place if the units are either not rented and, and occupied, given the significant need for these units, and um, if, the, if the units were you know, occupied by income ineligible individuals, in other words, people who are making more than who should be qualifying given the restricted affordability level. Thanks, Dave. Um, Larry, followed by Nathan Dean, uh, followed by Zena Josephs. Larry, I'm uh, unmuting you. Larry, I, I sent you a ask to unmute thing. You should, you should be able okay. to. Great. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Of course. Thank you. Okay. Hi. So my name is Larry. I live here in Ocean Park. I've lived here for 20 years, uh, very close to where this development is uh, proposed to be built. I would join the people who would be opposed to this. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I would be opposed to, to this development. Um, I feel like if this is to develop affordable housing in Santa Monica, then 100% of these units should be affordable. And I'd like to ask the city council who are hopefully gonna hear this recording to answer for why uh, this is not gonna be 100% uh, affordable housing if that's what's you know, the goal of the, of the uh, city council is for development. Second, I do ride my bike in Santa Monica and riding on Lincoln is very, very, very dangerous. It's one of the few streets I will not ride on. And I wanted to know if any of the four of you ride your bike on Lincoln and have experienced that because I know you're promoting all these bike, you know, spots within this complex. And I don't think that bike riding on Lincoln is feasible or safe. Lastly, I'd like to say that Lincoln is a uniquely bad street in all of Los Angeles. There's no side streets to take. 
that go north and south. People get off the 10, they come to work. They have to go down Lincoln. Venice is a zigzag and the golf course blocks north-south access. So everything, everything goes through Lincoln, which is why it's a snarl and can take 45 minutes to get five miles down the street in rush hour. Not to mention how this will reduce tourist dollars, which Santa Monica, I'm sure, is very interested in in the summer when there's the east-west stuff trying to get into the lot. So to me, it's just way out of scale. And to say that the grocery store removing it is somehow going to reduce traffic, people are going to have to buy groceries. They're going to go up to the Ralphs. They're going to go to the Whole Foods. They're going to be driving, except for the people who live literally above this. They're not going to be walking to the small grocery store in that. At least I don't think so. I think people are still going to drive because we don't have a subway. We don't have uh, advanced infrastructure. I lived in New York for many, many years. I know what taking subways is like. There is not, we don't have the infrastructure for public transport that's, uh, that people take that's effective and useful. So I think this project is out of scope to the neighborhood. Thanks, Thank Larry. Comments. Thanks. Um, the next speaker is Nathan Dean. Hello. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Maybe one of them is more of a comment. Um, during construction, are the sidewalks going to be closed? I find that very disruptive. Um, there's a construction on 14th Street that closed the sidewalks. So I can't walk up and down that. Um, Dave has talked a lot about this reducing traffic because people will live where they work. Obviously, that means that the people who live here work in Santa Monica and not downtown. Uh, I know, you know, when I went downtown pre-pandemic, half my office lived in Santa Monica, Venice. So you know, if they're just moving here because they make a lot of money and work downtown, that doesn't reduce traffic. Uh, it also can create more traffic interest in Santa Monica if they don't live near this unit, if they live work up in Montana area, then the Lincoln issue. Uh, and then I'm just wondering uh, if the, what the budgeted income for the developer is on this project or what the IRR is, the internal rate of return. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Um... Zena Josephs, you're on. Thank you. Um, a quick comment and a question. Uh, as Ann Hoover noted, uh, we only need 2,000 market rate units by 2029, and those are already in the can. We need 6,000 affordable units, so this 53 is really a drop in the bucket. Um, existing grade is the grade on the certified survey submitted with the project application, and probably 95% of the Gelson's parcel is it the Lincoln Boulevard elevation, not at the 10th court elevation and has been since around 1956. However, uh, using the segmented average natural grade, which Hank referred to, your drawings show the buildings being stepped up in rows so that the third row of buildings will tower over the existing three-story multifamily building at, 20, at uh, 1020 Ocean Park Boulevard that's next to 10th court. And then with the additional 18-foot rooftop structures atop 55 or 65 foot buildings, the rooftops on the third row now seem to be about 100 feet above Lincoln Boulevard. So what in the municipal code allows 100 foot tall buildings on Lincoln Boulevard, which is zone mixed use Boulevard low on the Gelson site? Thank you, Zena. Hank, do you wanna take the question, Zena's questions about the height measurements? Uh, yeah, we're, we're using the uh, segmented average natural grade, which does take uh, the grade level at the back of the site, um, which uh, in the midpoint of the rear parcel, which is at 10th court. It is up high, as you said, uh, and that's the way the code prescribes it. And then it's taken from the street level at Lincoln. So it does step back. Uh, that would be the case if this was a bunch of individual parcels and it would step up the same way uh, up the hill. Um, so so that is, that's the way the Santa Monica uh, code uh, prescribes uh, height, measuring height on slope sites. Okay, thank you. Um, our next caller is Kelly Shao, I think it's pronounced, uh, followed by Kurt, Peter Kurt, and Nancy Lukehaus. I'm sorry, I'm not doing those names very well. Kelly, I'm unmuting you. Hi, 
Um, so I live within 750 square feet of this new development. And like everyone said, I have concerns for the health and safety of my family due to, I believe, the increased traffic and congestion um, that I believe that this uh, development will cause, being that that area is already the second most dangerous corner of Santa Monica. But I do have three questions. First, um, were any of the comments from the January 11th meeting addressed in this current design? I think you mentioned they were, so I just wanna know specifically what those were. Um, additionally, what is the actual square footage of each type of unit in this project? I think you mentioned studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms. And then thirdly, will any of the market rate apartments be under rent control? And if so, for how long and how will rent increases be determined? Thanks. Thank you. So uh, why don't I take a couple of those? Um, we heard some comments, neighborhood concerns in the first meeting about some of the adjacencies with mechanical equipment, some of the landscaping on the ground floor, um, bike safety and bike amenities. And those are just examples of, uh, of, of, of aspects of the project that we're looking at closely and that potentially will result in some adjustments. Um, the project will not be subject to rent control Again, the, with the 53 very low income units will be more than rent controlled. They'll be restricted at the actual rent, not just uh, you know, rent increases per year, but the market rate units will not be subject to rent control. And uh, the width, that's two out of three. Hank, help me out with the third if you have it. It was a square footage. Square footage, thank you. Uh, thank oh, you. and then wait, Always. just a follow up to, you said you addressed from the first meeting um, changes. From this meeting, how will we know like what feedback you've incorporated? Well, the city actually requires us to report to them on changes and modifications to the project that were raised during the community meeting. And so again, the application hasn't been filed and the project is still evolving, but um, that goes into the file and the city actually requires a, a specific report on that. Hank, do you want to take Kelly's questions about the size of the units? The um, square foot? Sure. Uh, there is uh, size requirements uh, that are in play for affordable, affordable inclusionary housing in here. So one bedrooms, for instance, are a minimum of 600 square feet. Two bedrooms are uh, 850 square feet. Uh, the market rate units are... The, we have some studios that kind of average around 500 square feet. The one bedroom units, uh, 700, um, and then two bedroom units are around eight, 900 square feet. So it varies a bit. We have a variety of units in here. Um, so it, we don't have a, a, it all spelled out on the application uh, as yet. We're still refining all that. Um, so can I ask you one, just one more question? What will be the the rent you're going to charge for the market rate units. Do you guys have an estimate based we on a model that you've built? We don't know what that is. The, the project won't go to market probably for five years, and we do not know what the market rates will be, but the market rate units will charge what the market will bear at that point in time. But we don't, we don't know what that is today, given the time horizon that exists for the project. And you haven't built a model? Don't you have to build financial models for these developments for your investment? I, I don't have a financial model for the project. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Does Allison know as the owner of the till? Allison is not the residential developer. And um, so Allison does not, Allison has a sense of the commercial rents, but the residential developer um, is another entity, a partner with the property owner that Allison works with. Got it. Thanks. Thank you, Thank Kelly. You. Uh, and I, I just want to make a comment to somebody talked about sidewalk closures Thank um, you. Yeah. and the, the construction, the, the construction uh, folks have said what they'll do is they'll do what they call a sidewalk tunnel. Uh, so the sidewalk stays open and they have their, you know, you've probably seen these where the office and facilities are above the sidewalk in a structure uh, for the construction, for the construction team. They've also talked about maybe starting at the north side of the project and then moving to the south. So that, that means they've got good staging areas. Somebody asked about construction worker parking. So that way they can get uh, 
staging for construction workers, parking, materials, concrete trucks, whatever on that portion, and then they can do the rest uh, with less, less disruption. And in terms of the, uh, the issue of dust, look, one of the great things about the site is in 1955, they hauled all that dirt away and level it. So we only have one level of subterranean parking. So that's going to reduce a lot of the time frame for the excavation and also the dust, et cetera. Thanks, Hank. Um, moving on to Peter Kurt, followed by Robin, followed by Dorsonia at CSUN. So uh, Peter, I'm unmuting you. Hi, first I wanna thank you for holding this meeting. I also wanna commend you for uh, indicating that you'll stay through all the people that have asked to speak. Um, I think that's terrific. I'm kind of torn on the project. I do believe that that property could be put to better use, but I think like a lot of people have stated, the scope is a little too large. I also uh, don't particularly like the design. I think there's too many similar type buildings being built in Santa Monica. With Tonga Park nearby, it might be nice to incorporate some of the Native American elements as themes into the building. And I'm sorry I joined the meeting a little bit late. I use McCarthy Pharmacy a lot, and I'm concerned that they and other small independent businesses there won't be able to afford the rents. I live north of Wilshire, one block, and I know that there's businesses like um, Fuddruckers that was at 20th and Wilshire that couldn't afford the rent, went out of business. Um, Omar's Exotic Pets up at Sentinella in Wilshire. I knew Omar and talked to him a lot. As you can hear, I've got parrots in the background. He couldn't afford the rents and went out of business here. Um, other, you know, less expensive places like pickup sticks that people probably don't remember on Wilshire went out of business. What are you going to do to make sure that places like McCarthy's can still afford to be on this property? Thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, our next caller is a Robin Swicord. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. This is Nick on Robin's, uh, I'm on Robin's computer. See your um, name. Uh, I've been a uh, resident of Ocean Park for 46 years. Um, I have a comment and then a couple of questions. I don't want all of you to have any illusions about this project. What you're doing will destroy a community. Um, Dave said that he thinks that the size of this project is appropriate. All I can say is that's because you don't live here. Let me give you an example. I know you don't shop here. If you did, you would try to shop at Whole Foods. If you've tried to shop at Whole Foods, you know you can't find a parking space at Whole Foods. So what do you do? You go to Gelson's. Well, Gelson's won't be there anymore, or there'll be a much smaller version of Gelson's. The smaller version won't have everything that Gelson's presently has. And we won't have the UPS store. We won't have the dry cleaner. All those services won't be there. What this, we have a community here. And yes, that the fact that parking lot is really big, the fact that it's really big means we can always find a parking space. Um, I want to point out my second comment has to do with Dave saying that adding this large project with, with all this density will actually reduce pollution. Studies have shown it will reduce pollution. That's Orwellian. I'm sorry. If this project, if all those services go away, people will be driving to other grocery stores. That's going to add to pollution. They'll be driving to other UPS stores. They'll be driving to other dry cleaners. Okay, now I have two questions. The first has to do with, um, you kept, 
I kept hearing we had 15% affordable housing, but then we have 53 units. I can do the math. That's not 15%. The second question has to do with what I just heard, which is um, <clears throat> that you have uh, 800 and you have a, a two bedroom that's 900 square feet. That's 20 feet by 45 feet. Is that actually possible that that's the size of the unit? That's very small for two bedrooms. That's tiny, no? I'm done, thanks. Thank you. I want to answer the question about the calculation and analysis and maybe you can answer some of these general questions about um, you know, retail and tenants. So um, you're correct. The state density bonus law again, which this project is governed by, um, apportions the 15% very low income on the pre-density bonus component of the project. So what you effectively do to calculate that is to back out the density bonus units and assess the 15% on the base, uh, the pre-density bonus component. That is why the numbers reflect the 10% of the total. But when we say 15%, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, it's 15% of that pre-density bonus amount. Thank you, Dave. Um, well, I'll like just uh, chime in. I'm sorry, sorry Alice. Just, that's okay, just to answer some of the retail questions. And so, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, like re retail is an ever evolving and ever changing market. And um, we do see, you know, local businesses that um, struggle with online internet commerce. And, and we've seen a lot of struggles through the COVID era. And as a landlord owner operator, we do our best to work with those tenants to try to figure out, you know, how to make things work. I think that what makes retail so special is that when you think about merchandising a project, you want a lot of different types of tenants um, that cover small local mom and pop all the way to, you know, kind of some of the chains that you can rely on, like some of the comments they see you guys look to go to Michael's and Joanne's, et cetera. And so we do look to find the right mix in our projects and have all types of tenants. And that will certainly be, you know, at the forethought um, when we, you know, get five years down the road and have an understanding of um, what the demand is. Um, and we are kind of actively talking with all the tenants there um, to understand what their, what their trends are expected to be. And, um, you know, for example, Gelson's is a tenant that actually does want to be smaller. They have expressed that to us. Um, and so they are part of our larger conversation um, about the future of this property. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Alison. Um, the next speaker is uh, Dorsonia at CSUN, uh, followed by Osra and Ellen. Yes, I'm sorry. My name is Maria. I also, so I'm sorry that, that I didn't change my sort of uh, working uh, Zoom thing here. Um, so my, uh, of course, I, I very much wanted to thank the person that spoke before me because he said it so eloquently that this will really, 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 really destroy this place, its character, the, uh, you know, the beauty and everything that has attracted all of us to come live here. Uh, but my specific question is for you, Melissa, and at the very beginning of all this, somebody asked you if you were in any way, shape, or form connected to councilperson Glean Davis, and you kind of didn't want to, you know, you didn't respond to this question. So I don't know what the answer is, but, you know, just by not responding, it seemed like you had something to hide. And uh, also, you know, with other things that happened here, like, you know, people were reading off of scripts, um, you know, it, it, the whole thing seemed, again, very uh, farcical. So it would be very nice to hear from you. What are your connections to Glean Davis, if any? And since we're here, I also would like to hear from all of you, if you, uh, you have donated money to uh, California politicians, what are your connections to, you know, uh, uh, all this uh, uh, campaign uh, uh, processes that, you know, involve uh, real estate? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will answer that question. I uh, was a paid consultant on Gleam Davis's uh, last uh, city council campaign. Uh, that's the extent of it. It's all uh, public records, all of that, uh, donations and things like that. But I don't make donations, but I did work for Gleam Davis as a campaign consultant. And I can very clearly state that we don't make donations to politicians as a corporate policy. Okay, uh, next caller is Osra 
followed by Ellen Mark and Leslie Wilson. I hope I pronounced your name right, Osra. I've just unmuted you. I'll send a request to unmute. If you could unmute yourself. Osra, are you there? I can only ask you to I unmute, so. I don't, I don't think. Yeah, Osra perhaps. Okay, well, moving on. Um, our uh, next person, next participant is Ellen Mark, followed by Leslie Wilson and Helena Alter. Uh, Ellen? Ellen, you need to uh, unmute yourself on your screen. I just sent a request to unmute. Do you see that? Um, okay. Uh, is well, there an issue with the Zoom, or, or, or are we just getting uh, to a point? Where I don't know. Can... I don't. I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm, this is the normal process. I ask the uh, participant to unmute and then they unmute themselves. So uh, Ellen and Osra, um, uh, we're gonna move on. Um, and so that puts Leslie Wilson on deck. Leslie, I'm asking you to unmute so, so you can look at that. Hello, hi, I'm Leslie Wilson and I am, I'm disclosing that I'm an architect and I'm one of those architects who build most of the highest density projects in Manhattan and all over Los Angeles. So I've been where you are, Mr. Koenig, and I've been where you are, Allison. I know exactly where you're sitting there. Um, two things, for the city of Santa Monica, I do not understand. I've worked with the city of Manhattan. I've worked with all kinds of municipalities in California. Santa Monica is in a very unique position to have a good leverage with these developers to twist their arms to do the better products. And I do not see that happening. The projects along the Lincoln Boulevard in downtown, it is most horrendous 90s thinking of what the housing development should be. Although we are, this city is golden. I mean, anybody who developers comes in here, Bill, they will make money. Believe me, I've done those calculations throughout my cal you know, career, they make money here. And I don't know why city cannot twist their arms to do a better development project. Number two, this corner is very, very active corner. Unfortunately, it's very pedestrian. I mean, if anybody stood there, any of you stood there and watched this corner, it is a very, very few active corners on Lincoln Boulevard. And the project you, are, you guys described is like, it looks like it's gonna be a fortress of a security and everybody probably will have a very, very nice fence and cameras all over the place. That's not what, that's not how you appease the neighborhood, especially not this neighborhood. There are so many current brand new developers in Manhattan and San Francisco and LA that invites the ground floor becomes a park for the neighborhood and it becomes open, but still very secure for the tenants. There are very, very easy, cost efficient way to do that with all the technologies we have, but you don't seem to, this project is like a 1990s security design there. I mean, actually going back to eighties. There are so many ways, but there are projects that the platform in Culver City, the, even the edge project on the corner of a, you know, Link, uh, Bundy and Olympia, which is monstrously big, but the ground floor is completely open for the pedestrian traffic and experience. It's like outdoor mall with a park and outdoor spaces for the neighborhood communities. That is how you appease the client. And you know what, that, pro that idea will make your project guarantee longevity and then more attract the better tenants there and there will be the neighborhood better. Uh, Mr. Koenig, I've been a huge fan of your project for a long time. 
this project is not right for the site. It's not right for the neighborhood. It has to have a better, more forward-looking design for the development and what the developments can bring to this neighborhood. Not Thank you. Leslie, we're at more than two minutes. I really appreciate your comments. Thanks. And um, uh, let's see, uh, Helena Alter, I'm unmuting you. Can you hear me? I got it out of my system. <laughs> Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm new to this process. I've lived in Santa Monica for 39 years. According to some of the people in the chat, I live in the wrong part of Santa Monica. My daughter, my son-in-law, and my three grandchildren live in the area that's gonna be impacted. I don't know how I feel about the project, but I'm here out of interest. From what I've listened to and what I've heard, I think there are a bunch of unknowns. What impact is this gonna have on the school, in the schools in the area, the preschools, the elementary school, John Adams Middle School? You're marketing to 521 families as an ex-New Yorker, I can understand some people being appalled by the size of the two bedroom ap apartments, but are schools going to be able to handle the influx if you're marketing to families with children? What about police, paramedic and fire department response times? I haven't heard anybody talk about that at all. That area is a nightmare in terms of affordable housing, that is wonderful. But if you look at fair market rents for Santa Monica, are you going to be attracting a bunch of millennials, if that's the right generation, or people with lots of money to spend who are gonna put up dividers in the one bedroom apartments or the two bedroom apartments just like they did on the Upper East Side in New York. And rather than having a family or two adults with one child living there, you're gonna have four or five young adults. Has anybody looked at the ramifications of any of this? Thank um, you, Helena, you're, you're at two minutes. And I appreciate you know, you didn't, cut, you didn't cut off people that were supportive to you and I will happily stop talking, but I have to tell you that I've always heard about Santa Monica politics and what it's like. And this whole process to me just reinforces everything that I have heard about the city. And now I am willing to say goodbye. Thank you, Helena. Uh, the next person on deck is uh, Shiva, followed by Kent Strumpel, followed by Ronaldo. Um, Shiva, I'm going to unmute you. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, is anybody in the city, uh, city officials are connected to this uh, project and are they willing to notify Santa Monicans uh, that they are not involved, either them or their spouses are part of these uh, development uh, uh, companies? Okay, thank you, Shiva. And what's the answer? So why don't we stop and try and address some questions. Um, uh, so the public service issues and the infrastructure issues that Helena mentioned, I said this earlier in the meeting, but that is all part of the city's review of the project, both the administrative approval stage and also at the building permit stage. Um, the project has to pay a substantial amount in school fees. Um, it's state law that you have to do that for square footage and residential units. So there is a fusion of payments to the public school system as a result of this project. Uh, the larger the project, the bigger the payment and the more resources that go to the school district. 
Um, I'm sorry, Shiva, I didn't follow that question. I didn't understand it. Um, but, um, and so I, I can't answer it. Um, and someone else did. Uh, Dave, I, my understanding of the question was, are any of the city officials involved in some way in this project? Oh, okay. Thank you, Hank. No, right. the answer, Shiva, is absolutely not. Right. There's, this is a private development project. There's no one from the city involved in any way, shape, or form other than in their official capacity and reviewing the project as city officials. And, and, and in regard to the school uh, issue, is Santa Monica School District is, is uh, lacking students. They're allowing students from out of the city to come in uh, to their schools. Uh, because there's a shortage of students. So having more kids, having that, that fee, which is not insubstantial, will really help the school district. Um, and then I see in the chat people asking about my political contributions. The only ones I've made were recently to uh, Richard Blooms. He was running for county, county supervisor. I support Richard, Richard uh, because he has uh, a real commitment to affordable housing. Um, as you know, he's dropped out of that race. So uh, that was Thanks, my, Hank. my reporting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, Melissa, uh, how many more comments do we have? We're we now have an 13. hour over our time frame. It's uh, getting late. I think actually 11 because it shows us 13, but two were not responding. So okay. um, uh, we've got Kent Strumple. I will... Um, ask you to unmute Kent, after Kent Ronaldo, and after Ronaldo, Ryan. Uh, here we go, Kent. Great, I think I'm unmuted. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I actually think this project looks like a solution to many of the very serious problems that are confronting us today, from traffic to the affordable housing shortage, to the climate crisis. I think that projects like this actually help prepare us for the future by being way more resource efficient than far away suburban locations where people be, are being forced uh, into with insane commute distances to get to their jobs on the west side. Uh, traffic is a huge issue because transportation, including those big commutes, is the primary source of our city's planet warming carbon emissions. And locally, a big contributor to rush hour congestion is our low density suburban land use that forces most of us to drive nearly everywhere to get what we want. But the more we create communities where residents can find most of what they need on a daily basis within walking, biking, short transit ride, or get to a nearby job easily, perhaps in the car, the more we create what could be called complete neighborhoods, the less driving people will need to do and the more viable it becomes to get around by walking, biking, transit, or a short car trip. And in terms of the size of this project that many people have commented on, I think this is exactly the scale that we need to be going in to prepare us for the future. Projects of this scale are not like Manhattan, they more closely resemble the predominantly five-story height of cities like Paris and other very livable European cities. And by the way, many of those cities are also finding it possible now to convert their road space, currently dominated by cars, into pedestrian, bike, and transit facilities as well. They are demonstrating that mid-rise cities with well-designed density are very livable and sustainable. So I think projects along these lines are a climate solution. Uh, I do share okay. concerns about the amount of parking and whether it would be possible to make any of the units, including the market rate units available with no parking for those who don't want it and shouldn't have to pay for it. Uh, I think Kent, that's two you, minutes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's your two minutes. Thank you, Kent. Uh, our next person is Ronaldo Mera, followed by Ryan Brody and Anne Greenspan. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Dave, you made a comment in the beginning about this development being uh, with the uh, residential above and the businesses below. It was designed for the people that would want to live there. It had nothing to do with the community in general and the uh, ability to shop locally, buy locally. It doesn't address the congestion that has already been done. I don't want to go over all of this again because you've covered most of these points. Uh, I was born in the city, St. John's Hospital. I've lived here all my life. And at one time, this was an affordable city. If you had a decent job, you could buy a house, you could rent an apartment. It's become an elitist city since rent control was implemented. All of the good that this was supposed to do for people that are low income housing, it did not accomplish that. The average lot in Sunset Park now goes for $2 million, and then it will be developed after that. I don't see how this project will help anything. They talk about population density, that came up earlier. Population density, uh, I might, math might be a little wrong. There's 90,000 people, roughly eight square miles. It's over 10,000 people per square mile. That has to be one of the most densely populated cities in the country. The state has some kind of a mandate that we further congest this city. Our infrastructure is shrinking, our population is growing, and that leads to a lot of the problems that are inherent with this kind of a movement. Uh, you have kids that are going to school. There's a school across the street from this uh, com complex that you're talking about. When I grew up, I went into a vacant lot before the shopping bag was put in. We used to have rock fights and stuff like that. Not that that's a good thing, but you know, that's part of the experience of living in a city that has property for kids to grow up. The biggest unit you have in this development is that's 800 square feet. These are not family conducive. So you're not building anything for families. You're building things for, I think a previous person said millennials. That's one thing. Uh, there's, all, there's so many things here. Um, let me see, I still have a little time left. Ronaldo, uh, yeah, try to um, be succinct because you're at two minutes now. Okay, <clears throat> well, I think my point is you guys have hit a hornet's nest here and it's not gonna go away. So you might reconsider everything. And if you actually lived in the area here and experienced what these people are calling in about and complaining about, you might have a different view. Uh, you're in business to make a profit. I don't blame you for doing what you're supposed to do and what you're being paid to do. I think it's our city planning and our city council that has allowed this travesty to take place. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you, Ronaldo. Um, next on deck is uh, Ryan Broad, followed by Ann Greenspun. Ryan, I'm unmuting you. Thank you. All right, hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right, good. Um, I just want to add my comments to this project. Um, I'm in disagreement with this project. Um, as the future generation, as a member of the future generation, I believe this is not a good idea for the area because of the traffic. Um, and then I have some impacts that it'll be, that will be caused by this. Um, so first of all, there's obviously not a water, enough water to sustain all these people in the water table. If you keep pumping out, out water from the water table, the ocean is right next to it. It's going to come up and you're going to have the, the ground is going to start sinking and you're going to have uh, ocean water in your water table. And that's obviously not good. And then if you're thinking about having solar and you're a resident near this area, forget about your solar plants because you're going to have no sun. The tr there's going to be tremendous amount of dust created by this project, which in, in lots of dust is a whole bunch of carbon is released when it's getting turned around. And then also you have all these businesses that you've been talking about, all these small businesses that need support that are, are making their profit from people that are buying goods. And if there is no more of that, they're just gonna be kicked out because the rent is way too high. And that's obviously going to be a factor because it's a new building. What do new buildings have? High rent costs and everything like that. And it's just common sense econ shows that if there's less water, the price will go up. 
and you're just gonna make all the price go up for the rest of the residents in our in our area. Um, and then, and then Hank. By the way, there's no shortage in kids in school. I know that for a fact because I'm a kid, and there is, and they're making money off it. So I don't know what you're trying to say there, but also, um, I know my time's about to go, yep. but uh, just they're not gonna be affordable units. By the also, just the property value is too high. So I wish you the best of luck, and thank you for letting me talk on this panel. Thank you, Ryan. Um, let me unmute Anne Greenspan. Hmm. I don't see her anymore on the roster. Yes, I do. Can you see me? Uh, yes, now I can. Thanks, Sam. Uh, oh, okay. Should I start again? Yes, please. I'm not sure where I was. <laughs> oh my God, everybody must be so tired, including me. Okay, Hank, Melissa, Allison, and Dave, thank you for being here um, to answer our questions. I think we still need a lot more answers, so continue that. Um, uh, the Westside Urban Forum uh, had all the mayors meet this past week, Santa Monica, Hollywood, Culver City, Beverly Hills. They all agreed, all agreed that there is no housing crisis. It's an affordable crisis. Um, the, this project, uh, I think it's a little out of scale. It is out of scale for the, um, for the site. It's actually ginormous. It's on a hill, which makes it look bigger. And I would either cut it in half or perhaps use another location as others mentioned. Um, I think it should be more about function than form. Um, I wondered why you didn't have any more preliminary studies. They could be little ones to address the big issues that most of us are talking about tonight, traffic, safety, water, uh, to better answer our questions. Um, residents also should have protections, both to preserve the city and maintain our, um, our, our visual character. Um, so I wondered what kind of weight um, did we carry with you guys tonight? And my last question is, I was trying to save the chat here, but I don't know if the chat's controlled by you because I can't seem to save it. I know there's three little dots, but they don't show up. So that was my question. Thank you, Anne. We'll answer that. It's the first question we've gotten in a while. We've gotten a string of comments, but um, the, the answer to your question about the studies is, and those are typically things uh, you know, all critically important things that will be evaluated in detail, and not by the developer, but by the uh, objective third party city and their subject matter experts during the process. We're at the earliest possible stages, just starting this. And so that that all gets vetted through. It's just part of the process. Um, so, um, and, and with respect to the comments tonight, I, I don't know about the chat, but, you know, we are taking these comments in, they're gonna be provided to the city, they're gonna be part of the public process. Um, and, you know, that's, we've, we've done that not once, but twice now as part of this applicant team. So um, hopefully that addresses those questions. And, and Melissa, if you know the answer to how, to how to get the chat, but it will be part of the public record since it will be submitted to the city. I don't know from the participants um, standpoint on this particular format, so but it, it is recorded as part of our recording. It's recorded as a text uh, file. So we will have that as part of our um, uh, summary. Um, I wanna move on to, uh, we're now at 10.06 PM. So I'm going to move on to Susie Barajas and followed by Larry and AJ. Susie. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, um, thank you for holding this. There's just a couple of points and maybe a question here and there. With the regards to traffic, I live on Maple Street between 10th and 11th. And I can tell you since Ocean Park went down to one way, both each way, our traffic on our street has increased. So with the traffic, I would appreciate that you guys consider the streets that we have on your traffic report. 
because people go speeding down our street and my kids, I don't even let them play outside anymore. Um, number two, with the affordable subsidized housing, which units are you gonna assign to that? Two bedrooms, one bedrooms. Um, and I just wanna reiterate, housing isn't the issue, it's the price of housing. That's the issue here. Um, you keep encouraging cleaner modes of transportation. I'm a mom, I work in Santa Monica, I can't ride my bike. When I go grocery shopping, when I take my daughter to school, can't do that. So it's great encouragement, but let's be real, it's not gonna happen. Um, you are destroying this community. I've grown up here, I've lived on this street um, and I moved back and it is a destroying the community here. Um, the police can't even handle the current issues we have in Santa Monica. How are they gonna handle this? Um, and Hank, I'm not sure where you hear that the parking lot, the Gelson's parking lot is dangerous. That's not an accurate statement. Um, and which city council members live in this community that they'll experience what we're gonna go through. And that's it. Yeah, Thank thanks. you, Susie. Susan. Your one question in there, um, Susan, I, I, the, the affordable units and their, the type of them, whether they're studios, ones or two bedrooms will reflect the proportionate unit mix of the market rates. So it will be a blend and the blend will be the same percentage as the market rate units. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Larry is up next, followed by AJ and uh, Mike Feinstein. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I, I, I have to thank you guys for staying up so late and taking speakers till the end. And it's really appreciative. Um, I want to ask if any of you really care that 80 to 90 percent of the residents in Ocean Park and Sunset Park and, and, and maybe five or seven Santa Monica City Council members don't want this project as as presented. Do you care? Do you really care? I'd appreciate four honest answers. Thanks again. Thank you, Larry. Uh, we're moving ahead. It is, we have eight speakers left, I think probably Six is the actual number. Uh, AJ, I'm going to unmute you, followed by Mike uh, and uh, Karen. AJ. AJ. You're, you're un I can see you're unmuted there. Before AJ goes, let me just answer the last question. And the answer is, do we care about what the public thinks about the project? Of course we care. Um, and I, you know, I don't know that your 80 to 90% is a statistical account. There's people who have strong views about this project on both sides of the equation. And, and it, this, this developer and this applicant team cares deeply about how the projects are perceived, both the city and the community. Uh, so that's a heartfelt answer to your heartfelt question. We may not agree on outcomes uh, on various things, but we do care about the public perception and, and how, how, how this whole effort is perceived. Uh, AJ, are you there? I see your square. I see that you're unmuted. Hmm. Uh, if you are not that. unmuted, we can't hear you. Um, okay, I think we're going to need to move on. Um, Mike, uh, you're unmuted, followed by Karen Croner and uh, Dan Ferris. Here we go, Mike. Uh, great. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm actually calling in from the jungle in a small village in Mexico. It's amazing. Um, I'm going to phrase my concern as a question so that Dave is happy, and that is that I, I don't feel that we can uh, solve the whole state housing crisis. Oh, we lost him. We lost you. You went on <laughs> mute, Mr. Feinstein. Okay, I'm, ba I'm back again. There you are. Okay, so since we can't solve the whole state housing crisis with one project, on the last call, I mentioned the former concept of activity center for this um, 
corner, which Hank deftly deflected at the time. And the trade-off that I see between that concept then and now is back then the idea of such a large corner, if a, a developer was going to develop the project with greater um, size, they really had to get into a lot of negotiation and be very creative about the design. And I thought at that time we would get a community center. Now what we have is a dense housing project with some nice spaces in between. And I think we're losing, this is such a critical corner, we're losing the opportunity to make a center. And, and even in terms of the design, it doesn't really speak to all these four streets crossing and looking in. This strikes me as something that would fit in the middle of the block in the middle of a big city, but not as a corner and not as a place that you would go to, to go to for a happening, for something being there and it's missing the chance. And if we look, I know that you wanna deal with the sound on Ocean Park Boulevard, but if you're thinking about what the street's gonna be like in 50 years, and you're gonna have a lot of dense housing, we're also gonna have electric cars and it's not gonna be as noisy, so I'm just feeling like you've made a choice, a trade out here to max out on what the state allows now um, by right. And we've lost the chance to have a more creative site. And yes, it would have been less money and a little bit less housing, but there aren't many corners that are so major in terms of long-term ur urban design and what this street could look like 30 or 40 years from now. So I guess, you know, did you debate that trade off? And maybe it was just dollars and cents from the people who, who are investing here, but I think we're losing a historic opportunity with this corner to be great and it's just okay, over. Thanks, Mike. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, we're getting down to the last few. Uh, Karen, I'm going to unmute you, followed by Patricia and then Tamara. Hi there. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Um, listen, I think what Mike just said is is spot on. This is a remarkable opportunity for this corner, and I think what Nick said earlier is essential. He said you're decimating, decimating the community and the neighborhood, and I think that everybody here needs to really take that to heart and think about it. And Hank, I have been a huge fan of your work from when you first started out and saw you as an artist. And I know that you can do better than this. And um, I find it, I guess my, what, what's very clear here is there's a community that's saying, do better. We, we believe in our local shop owners. We believe in our community. We believe in our neighbors. We believe in why. Oh, We're losing you, Karen. Karen, you're breaking up. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Sorry. Look, we're all working people. You guys want to make as much money as possible off of this development. I get it. We want to uh, maintain a, a, a community that is life affirming and really, really fucking meaningful. So I guess the question I would have is, is there a compromise? Are you even considering a compromise? How much smaller would you be willing to go to create something spectacular? Thanks, Karen. Yeah, and the answer is, you know, this, this meeting is about getting that kind of feedback, um, specific, broad, general, all the rest of it. And the applicant team has to take this under consideration. Um, and, uh, and think through some of these things. I don't have an answer for you on the spot, Karen, but that's why the community meeting is held. And, and I just want to say we're at the beginning of that design process, yeah. right? We've, we've submitted a concept in here. We're, we're gathering input from you guys and uh, the design's going to develop as we move forward. I think you said it's going to be a good year process here at least, and then uh, another year to get building permits, etc. cetera. Um, and so there's a lot of time there for the, the design to improve um, and we'll be bringing on various consultants to help us in that endeavor. Thanks Hank. Um, we have two call our two uh, speakers left. 
uh, Patricia and Tamra, and then I'm going to just revisit a couple who uh, were not responding. So Patricia, I'm unmuting you. I don't think Patricia's interested in making a comment. Patricia, I'll just give her another opportunity. I just sent an ask to unmute. If you could just try unmuting your um, computer. Uh, okay. Um, then uh, I think we have one person left in the queue. Uh, Tamara uh, Raven, I'm unmuting you. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. So Allison, at the beginning, you said that you cared about the community. I think now you've heard from the community on the Zoom meeting, at least 90% of the people here have said that you're gonna hurt this community with this project. Can you acknowledge that you heard that tonight? Allison, I'm looking to you to really answer this question. I think that there's a larger community of Santa Monica that we are very interested in, in making sure that this center serves all of it, including the neighborhoods directly next to it. And I very much have heard every comment that was said tonight. And as Dave said just a minute ago, um, there's a lot to digest here. A lot of info has been asked and discussed, and we'll certainly take that back. Um, and, and also we'll be submitting all of this to the city as well, as Dave mentioned earlier. So. Um, Thank you to everyone for uh, your time tonight and for your comments. We are listening. I, I, I definitely disagree with you. I think you need to listen to 9% of the people who talked tonight who don't believe this project. And I really hope we can find a way to make you all go away because it's not for this community. You're going to destroy this community. Thank you, Tamara. I'm just looking at, um, there are three hands still up. Uh, Patricia R., Ellen Mark, and Osra. Um, I will ask Patricia to unmute and Ellen and Osra and uh, see if you're still there uh, because we're at the end of the line here. And I think these will be the last three speakers. Melissa. Yes, they will be. Okay, I've asked Patricia. Ellen just asked her to unmute. I don't see anything. And Osra. Okay, we're not getting.